Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we are going to get started here with the 2021 Crop Management Input Seminar. Um, I'm really happy to see, well, get to uh, put on this program for you guys here today and hopefully bring forth some ideas and concepts that are really hitting you um, in your, your farming operations. And so it looks like we've got approximately 60 people on this morning. Um, so that's a great start for today, and hopefully um, we can get a few more here as the morning uh, can, continues to build, as well as this program is being recorded. And so for those that aren't able to attend in person, we will have that recording available for them after the fact so they can watch at a later time as well. But first off, I just want to, again, welcome you guys to the 2021 Crop Management Input Seminar. Uh, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Karen Johnson. I work with the University of Minnesota Extension in McLeod and Meeker counties. And this program has had a lot of uh, standing history and tradition here in the McLeod County area. And I'm happy to be able to bring forth a program um, that fits in with that tradition moving forward. And I appreciate the, the uh, transition that we've had to do um, to be flexible with our current scenario out there in the world to having this be virtual uh, versus in person. And we certainly hope that we can be back in person here uh, coming into that next year. And so this year's program, we really wanted it to design it so that um, we could focus on the needs of McLeod County farmers and farmers in the surrounding area. And so we really wanted to hit on things that, that uh, needed um, or a variety of different topics that we felt really were meaningful to farmers. And so we're gonna talk grain marketing. Uh, we've got a, a speaker on an IPM update for both insects and diseases, as well as uh, just thinking more about nutrient management out in our field. And then finally wrapping up the day with a, a panel discussion about a variety of the herbicide traits that are available within McLeod, uh, Minnesota corn and soybean varieties. So before we get started here, um, I do want to just take a couple minutes to do some housekeeping um, items. We really tried to design today's program to be kind of short and sweet with each topic, um, 30 minutes plus a little bit of time for questions. So please feel free to, to um, share those questions and we'll make, try our best to get them answered uh, throughout today's program. This program could not have happened without a couple of different groups that really um, work to pull uh, all the different components of this event together. So first and foremost, um, I work very closely with the Hutchinson uh, Chamber of Commerce Agribusiness Committee, and many of you might know who they are or people that serve on that committee, but it's a really dedicated group of community members that focus on educational and support for agricultural businesses uh, beyond McLeod County. And traditionally, this group focuses on three main uh, areas that we do um, education in. So first and foremost, this program, our December Ag Seminar. We also put on a very nice uh, Dairy Education Day in June in Hutchinson, as well as a very special program called the Farm Fatigue Buckets that we do in partnership with the Glencoe Chamber of Commerce. So if you know anybody that serves on this committee or if you're interested in being a part of this committee, let one of us know and we'd uh, be happy to join or welcome some new uh, committee members as well. We also have some very dedicated current and past sponsors for this program. Um, I hope you were able to catch some of them when you were looking at the PowerPoint that was running as we got started. So just a couple that I wanted to name off. Um, Compure Financial, uh, Dwayne Yindra Crop Insurance Agency, LLC. Farm Bureau Financial Services, uh, Ryan Ebert, Elbert, excuse me, Heartland Ag Systems, Hutchinson Health, Indigo Ag, uh, LG Seeds, the McLeod County Corn and Soybean Growers, the um, Mid Country Bank, Plumbing and Heating by Craig, Skyview Dairy, and Walmart. 
We also have four very special sponsors that have been gold level sponsors for several years that we will be featuring throughout today's program as they help us introduce a number of our speakers this morning. Um, it seems that people are starting to get things figured out here uh, in terms of Zoom, but I do wanna walk through a couple of things. You probably notice as participants that you do not have access to utilizing your camera or your mic. Uh, we have purposely set up the program this way. And so if you do have questions, we've got two ways that you can connect with us. So first, if you've got a question for our speakers, we would like you to utilize the Q&A function, uh, which is found in the navigation panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and there should be a box that pops up that you can ask questions of our speakers. Um, and we'll do our best to get those um, asked of our presenters uh, either during or after the presentation. We also have the chat function. This sends a message directly to um, the host of the event. So if you're having technical service, um, technical issues with your computer or trying to figure out the best way to uh, view today's program, type a question in there and we'll do our best to help answer that as well. Um, we'll also be utilizing polls in one of our uh, presentations today. So to get you comfortable and started with that, we would like you to answer one poll to get started. And you should see it launching into your screen right now. And so we would really like people to let us know where they're from. Um, I know we're, we're kind of focusing in the McLeod County areas where this event kind of originates from, but if you happen to fall in those surrounding areas or outside that area, please hit the other button and kind of let us know where you're from or coming from today. We'll give that just a minute here to kind of get rolling what looks like about 63 percent of people have voted already give that just another couple seconds here Okay, uh, so we got 47 uh, people out of our 63 that did vote. Um, and so it looks like we've got kind of a variety um, across the area, 40% coming from McLeod County and another 40 from outside of kind of that surrounding area. So with that, I will... I would like to introduce um, our first Gold Star sponsor um, by the name of Scott Lang with Citizens Bank and Trust to introduce our first speaker. We offer all the products that you need from operating lines of credit, equipment and real estate loans with flexible terms and great rates, along with home banking and mobile deposit. Ben Beckman and I would be honored to have a conversation with you to discuss how we can meet your needs now and into the future. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Edward Hussey. Edward Hussey serves as a grain marketing economist for the Center for Farm Financial Management at the University of Minnesota, the developers of FinTech software and a variety of educational programs. Working with his colleagues at CFFM and in Extension, Ed developed the award-winning Winning the Game series of workshops. In addition, he manages Commodity Challenge, an online marketing education game that uses real-time cash and future data. He teaches commodity markets at the university and is a regular contributor for Corn and Soybean Digest, 
and farm futures. The second edition of his book, Grain Marketing is Simple, It's Not Just That Easy, was released in November of 2015. Let's welcome Ed Usson as he shares some grain marketing tips. Good morning. Let me get my uh, PowerPoint up here. Can you all see it, I hope? Uh, let me, uh, there we are. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Karen, for inviting me to be part of this uh, virtual crop management input seminar. And thank you to all the Gold Star sponsors that helped put it together today. You know, my preference would be to do this live. Uh, I, I'm sure some of you listening have seen me before. That's all of our preferences. But for now, uh, I'll tell you what I told my students at, a, at the start of the semester a couple months ago. You make the best of it, people. It is, it, it, uh, uh, you simply have to make the best of what you have. And we're going to make the best of it here today. I wanna share some grain marketing tips from some of my best friends, some ideas on marketing that I hope you can use uh, now and in, in future years. Here are some of the friends we're gonna to meet today. I want you to meet Barney Binless, who serves as my benchmark. We're gonna meet Aunt Tilly, who has a simple pre-harvest marketing plan. Peter Paper Farmer, I use to explore the value of options, call options in particular. May Sellers is a producer with grain held in storage and she has an exit plan. I want to talk about that. And I want you to meet Hank Holder, uh, uh, a producer, a celebrity, make believe producer, of course, in my mind, uh, who, like May Sellers, has uh, storage for his crop after harvest, but makes the mistake of holding grain in storage too long. Just a little bit on the methodology here. Uh, uh, starting a year or two ago, I now moved away from uh, southwestern Minnesota prices from one point and I'm using Iowa average prices. Please don't let that throw you. Uh, the conclusions for Iowa, the patterns in Iowa and in Minnesota are the same the conclusions I reach would not change if I had uh, average Iowa, Minnesota prices. Uh, we use this data to look for strong tendencies in marketing patterns, but I assure you nothing is 100%, and uh, that's not going to be there. And finally, I, I, I find it interesting to look for large differences where one character is beating another by more than 10%. That's sort of my proxy for a significant difference in uh, two marketing strategies. And I find this is an interesting aspect of the numbers. Well, let's start with Barney Binless. And by the way, if you have questions, uh, what we are gonna do, I'm gonna make time for them at the end of this presentation. So I hope to take this to about 9.35 and that'll leave us five minutes from 9.35 to 9.40 to answer questions. So let's meet Barney Binless, who is our benchmark. Barney has no marketing plan, no storage, and no interest in early pricing. He's our benchmark. If I'm going to invite you to explore some marketing ideas and the value of those marketing ideas, how do you measure that compared to what? Well, that's Barney's role. Uh, we're gonna compare things to the benchmark harvest price. If we can't beat the harvest price, why bother? So we have, Barney's a very important guy in my world. By the way, just giving you some dates here. Uh, harvest for Barney over the last 30 years has always been the Friday between October 12 and 18, uh, the week earlier for soybeans and uh, the Friday between August 20 and 26 for wheat. It's important that you recognize that Barney's uh, activities, all of my characters' activities are predetermined. I'm not cherry picking dates. I'm not futzing with the data to make things look good or make some character look bad. This is already set. 
And uh, the Friday between next, you can look it up at, for 2021. I don't know if that'll be the best day in October or the worst day in October. Time will tell. It will be the Friday between the 12th and the 18th. Well, let's meet on Tilly, uh, uh, a producer who suggests that we keep it simple. She likes it simple. She's going to price 20% of her new crop grain each month uh, from the four months, March, April, May, and June. So she is pre-harvest pricing 80% of her crop. I'm also making the un stated assumption that she's buying crop insurance at the 80% level. She takes action every month, regardless of how high or low the prices are. She just does it. Now, uh, she is going to make her sales on the Tuesdays between the 4th and the 10th of each month for corn and soybeans uh, and for wheat. Uh, however, note that in spring wheat, uh, she starts a month earlier in February and ends a month earlier in May. By the way, she's getting 80% of her crop sold. You say, well, what about the other 20%? Hey, I make her price that at Barney's Harvest Price, and it's part of her results you see here. Well, this is, uh, some of you may not be convinced, it's only 32 years of data. Uh, Tilly is beating Barney by an average of 16 cents a bushel. Now, just to put that into perspective, that 16 cents a bushel on every bushel of corn produced over a 32 year period. She's beating Barney in 24 of 32 years. That's three out of four years. Nothing is 100%. And look at how often she beats Barney by more than 10%. Half the years, 17 of 32 years. Barney has his moments and always will. Uh, he has beaten Tilly by more than 10% in six of 32 years. We'll look at it for soybeans. Tilly's got a 24 cent advantage on every bushel of soybeans produced over a 32 year period. Years beating Barney, 18 of 32, doesn't look that impressive but it seems to be paying off over time. And uh, she has the edge on these big years, uh, 10 to six on uh, more than a 10% margin in price. Uh, it was mentioned earlier in the introduction, I do have a book out, Grain Marketing is Simple. Uh, it's just not easy. I think some of you are familiar with it, but it is still available. And if you go online to the Center for Farm Financial Management, uh, you can buy a copy for yourself if you don't already have it. Uh, might make a hell of a Christmas present or, or maybe the worst Christmas present you've ever given. I'm not sure of your family situation. So uh, you might think about it. And uh, all funds, all funds go to the University of Minnesota. Let's meet Peter Paper Farmer and ask if options add value. Now, after harvest, Peter uses options before and after harvest. Let's address after harvest first. Like Barney, Peter has no storage. So he sells his crop at harvest, just like Barney does at Barney's price but he reowns those harvest sales with at the money call options. Peter, after harvest, will get the harvest price plus the profit or loss from buying at the money call options at harvest and holding them to expiration. Now, uh, he, does, he sells at Barney's harvest price, but for corn and soybeans, he's reowning July options on November 1st and holds them to expiration, which is gonna be somewhere in that third week of June, does this every year. Uh, for wheat, he's buying at the money May calls on September 1 and holding them to expiration uh, uh, in the third week of April. Well, this is uh, Peter's results for corn. I may not show you every uh, commodity, they're very consistent. You can see that over the long run, options have cost Peter money 
after harvest, six cents a bushel. They cost money. Uh, he has beaten Barney in five of 32 years. Not exactly a great batting average. And how often has Peter beat Barney by more than 10%? Well, about one out of every 10 years. And I can think of some of those years. But Barney has beaten Peter by more than 10% in nine of 32 years, which is another way of saying that the options cost more than 10% of the harvest price and Peter lost that money in those years. He has a better record, by the way, in soybeans and a similar record in wheat, poor record. Now, before harvest, Peter does something different. He's mimicking another character I'm going to introduce you uh, to. He's going to do some pre-harvest pricing before harvest and re-own with at the money December corn or November soybean calls and he holds them to mid-September. Now, to understand Peter's activities before harvest, you need to meet Terry Timer. Terry knows that seasonal highs and new crop futures often occur in the spring, so she's going to use the dates to price 20% increments, March, April, May, and June, four months, just like Tilly. Here's where Terry and Tilly differ, though. Terry has a minimum price objective. And she will not price if prices are below her production costs. She, was, she and Peter are not active every year before harvest. Some years, like this past year, uh, the opportunity was less than production costs. They didn't do anything. Well, what I'd like to do first is compare Peter with his option strategy to Terry. These are two people doing the same thing on the same day. The only difference is Peter insists on reowning with call options. And you can see that that cost him six cents a bushel. Terry's averaging 307, Peter 301. Uh, okay, I, I, I think I would have assumed that. Now, let's compare Peter to Barney. And we see that Peter's use of options before harvest do in fact, in the long run, help him beat Barney by a dime. I'm impressed by that. And uh, the margin of greater than 10%, uh, seven, of, seven times Peter beat Barney by more than 10%, twice Barney beat Peter by more than 10%. So on the one hand, if you look at it this way, Peter's strategy with options before harvest is useful. Uh, and yet, comparing it to Terry, he'd be even better off without the options. Well, I can't help but ask a quiz here uh, concerning options. How often would you expect to profit from a simple strategy of buying at the money calls and holding them to expiration? By the way, this goes beyond corn and soybeans. It could, could be on gold. It could be on a, um, a Apple computer calls, I mean, stock calls, how often we, would you expect to make money? Markets move three ways. They move up, down, or sideways. And if you're buying a call, the right to own futures, you know that only the higher market scenario helps you. There are three scenarios, a higher market helps you, the answer must be 33%, correct? No, that's not correct, because you're paying for the right. And if you pay for the right, if you pay 25 cents for a corn call and the market goes up 20 cents, you still haven't made money. It's going to be something less than 33%. And I've always felt that it's somewhere around 25% of the time. Okay, for lack of just, just picking a number, I'll say about one out of four years. Well, I've got Peter Paper Farmer and uh, 31 years of data uh, going back to 1989 and his success rate in corn and soybeans and wheat before harvest and after harvest. I've got a lot of data on Peter. And uh, I asked the question now, since 1989, how often has Peter Paper Farmer profited from the purchase of that the money calls before and after harvest? What did theory say? 25%. And what is the reality? He's made money 23% of the time. Well, 
Uh, do options add value? I would say at best, the record is kind of mixed on call options. Uh, I never say never on, on options. I do say be selective and, um, and they aren't going to cure all of your marketing problems, but be selective because the record there is mixed. Uh, I run an online uh, educational program called Commodity Challenge. It's a trading game, very popular with high school and college students. It's available now, mobile friendly on your cell phone. It's educational and it's free. And we uh, uh, get help from CHS Foundation for this. And this last year, uh, with, the prob with the pandemic spreading out there, uh, I developed an online course featuring 16 video lessons called Getting Started with Commodity Challenge. If you want to learn more, send me an email. I can start a game for your uh, school, for your college, for your private group. Private groups use it too. Okay, let's meet May Sellers. And uh, her tip is to have an exit plan. May is a producer with on-farm storage. She holds her crop in the bin to sell in late May, the last week of May, hence her name, May Sellers. Her price is the cash price of corn and soybeans uh, at the end of May, less variable storage costs. I don't let any of my characters assume storage is zero. I'm gonna charge her eight cents a bushel shrink on her corn. 11 cents a bushel shrink on our soybeans. I'm also going to charge them interest on their money. By the way, if you're a wheat, uh, a wheat producer, uh, she sells her hard red spring wheat in late fall, actually the first week of December. Uh, this is showing you the exact days. Now, May also has a storage constraint. She only has room for 80% of her crop. That's a pretty generous amount of storage I've given her, which means of course, she does not have storage for 20% of her crop. What happens to that 20%? She sells it at harvest at Barney's harvest price. And it's part of the results I show you here. By the way, this is a long-term pattern in Minnesota corn prices over the last 30 years. This, by the way, is a very enduring pattern in uh, corn prices throughout the corn belt. If I, had, uh, if I had the chart, I do have it for Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Illinois, they all look like this. Prices tend to be lowest at harvest, highest in the spring. And can you see why May likes to sell in late May or early June? By the way, there's nothing, you know, Please don't walk out of walk away from this little presentation and tell yourself, well, Ed says the last May of day, the last week of May is the best time. It might be in the first half of June. It's somewhere in that time period. Here it is in soybeans too. It's pretty obvious why May sellers likes to do something like that. This, by the way, is Illinois soybean prices. Don't let that throw you. Looks just like the Minnesota pattern. Uh, as easy as that looks, I got to tell you, May had tough going in the year of COVID. 2020 was 2019-20 was a cruel year for May sellers. Here's that uh, seasonal pattern. I showed it to you before. It looks a little flatter only because I've changed the scale on the left you still have uh, this 30 year average going higher. This is last year for May sellers. Look at how prices went from to uh, late summer. It was in fact, I've got 32 years of data on uh, May sellers. It was her worst year on record. Despite that, despite her suffering through the worst year on record, it's part of what I'm showing you here. And May Sellers, net of storage costs, net of variable storage costs, and 20% of her grain 
is sold at, at Barney's harvest price. With those things factored in, she's beating Barney by an average of 16 cents a bushel over the last 30 years, 31 years. She's beating Barney uh, more often than not. There are a number of years where Barney beats May just based on uh, uh, storage costs. In other words, the maize price in the spring is really not much different than Barney's, but after I take into account storage costs, she ends up less. How often does she beat Barney? By more than 10%. She's got almost a three to one edge, 11 years versus four for Barney. Soybeans, maize beating Barney by 50 cents a bushel net of storage costs, and including the fact that 20% of her grain is sold at harvest. Uh, beating Barney in 20 of uh, 31 years and has a two to one edge or better on years greater than 10%. May Sellers has an exit plan. Uh, I suspect that a lot of people listening today have grain in the bin. Uh, my only point with May Sellers is she knows when she's getting out of this and uh, you need an exit plan too. May's is based on timing and it works very well for her. I suggest that you not only think about timing, but think about price. How much higher than the harvest price? Uh, are you looking for 50, 50 cents more than the harvest price, 30 cents, 80 cents? Have you put a number on it? Uh, I think the lack of an exit uh, strategy, the lack of, a, of what it is you're looking for written down uh, is a big problem for a lot of producers. Boy, I'm disappointed. We have no snow so far. Uh, I'm an avid skier of the American Berkebiner uh, held every year in Hayward, Wisconsin. I've signed up again. It'll be a ver it may be a virtual race, although they're trying to do it live. I am signed up for uh, a Friday in the third week of February. Y'all, uh, the Berkebiner is a Norwegian thing, or at least our, the American Berkebiner is uh, follows the original Norwegian Berkebiner. It's intended to to uh, mirror that. There's also something up in Mora, Minnesota called the Vasalopet, which is a Swedish thing. And I'd just like to show you the jersey they gave me uh, a couple of years ago for the Mora Vasalopet. Notice my number, 6666. Isn't the devil 666? I think I'm one better than the devil. I, I found that, uh, well, a little scary. Okay, final player, Hank Holder. Don't store grain too long. That's his tip. Hank is our perennial bull. He's always convinced that prices are about to surge higher, but he only has enough storage on his farm for one crop. So every year, right before harvest, he's taking his crop out of the bin, sending it to market to make room for the new crop. Uh, his price is the price of corn and soybeans and wheat at the following harvest, a year later, less a year's worth of storage costs. Um, these are the dates, just like May Sellers, by the way, Hank only has room for 80% of his crop. So he's going to uh, price 20% of his grain at harvest, stores the other 80%. And as you can see, he is selling his grain on the Friday of the week before harvest uh, in each case. Now, I've emphasized Barney as uh, our benchmark, but I, I think the right comparison here is not Barney and Hank, but May and Hank. Here we've got two producers doing the same thing. May and Hank both sell 20% of their crop at harvest. They both store 80%. They both pay variable storage costs, okay? The only difference is how long they hold that grain. May gets out by the end of May, Hank Holder holds it for uh, through the summer, another four and a half, five months. How's Hank doing here? By the way, Hank beat May last year, this last year. Hank had an air victory. He does win once in a while. May is beating Hank by an average of 40 cents a bushel on every bushel of 
corn produced over 31 years. She's beating Hank in 22 of the 32 years. Look at this, her margin, 10% or better. She's beaten Hank. She beats Hank 22 years. In 20 of those years, her margin was greater than 10%. Here, here's the thinking on 10%. Uh, you know, if I'm selling my corn for three and a half dollars and my neighbor's getting 360, a 10 cent difference, is that is that a big deal? I mean, I don't know if that's a big thing. But you know, if my neighbor is consistently beating me by 10% or more, 35 cents on 350 corn, 50 cents on $5 corn, well, I may have an issue. And May is beating Hank. Uh, by four to one margin. Almost every year she beats Hank, it's by more than 10%. I find that interesting and a little bit alarming. Soybeans, May's advantage is uh, only 85 cents a bushel and beating Hank by a margin of 16 to three on years greater than 10%. Hank is breaking something I call the 11th commandment of grain marketing, which is thou shall not hold unpriced grain bin and grain in the bin beyond uh, July 1, June 1 for wheat people. Um, would the pros ever ignore this? Boy, I hate picking on uh, pro farmer, but uh, yeah, they. Uh, I, I find them routinely holding grain deep into the summer. They did so in 2017. And at the end of August, finally said, well, you ought to sell that grain. And, you know, it only cost them the better part of 40 cents a bushel. They did it again in 2018 when May beat Hank by almost 50 cents a bushel. Hell, they did it again in 2019. But you know what? This last year, uh, Hank actually beat May by a couple of cents. So they got a little bit back. Okay, uh, I've shared some tips with you. These are tips that don't just apply to this year, they apply to every year. And uh, if we can, let's take a moment to review them. Uh, Tilly, who we met, enjoys solid success with a simple pre-harvest marketing plan. Marketing does not need to be complicated, people. Tilly's pricing 10% of her new crop corn and soybeans in the months of March, April, May, and June. That's all she's doing. Up to 80% of her crop, and she's doing very well over time. Every time, no, but over time, yes. Peter Paper Farmer, uh, Paper farming with call options has at best a mixed record of results. I always say on options, I'd never say never, but use selectively. They are not gonna cure all of your marketing woes. May Sellers has an exit plan based on seasonal patterns and it, it works very good and um, uh, works well over time. And the question I ask you with grain in the bin is what's your exit plan? And uh, finally, we met Hank Holder, who disobeys the 11th uh, commandment of grain marketing. And uh, the numbers indicate that Hank is paying an incredibly big price for holding grain too long, even though, even though if I took you back over 30 years, it's surprising how often Hank Holder goes home with the gold medal beating everyone. He does so once out of every five or six years, the guy beats everyone at drought years. Those are Hank's years. Um, but the exception is not paying off in the long term. Uh, I do have a new workshop out there. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, it's how to get $4 corn, where it's about two and a half hours long. We play a simulation game, meet some new producers. The whole idea is this is about combining Marketing start to finish, combining pre and post harvest marketing to get the best price possible uh, for your corn, possibly soybeans and wheat too. There's no reason the strategy can't work in there too.
But if you are interested in sponsoring a workshop for uh, maybe customers or, or neighbors in the area, get a hold of me. I'd love to do it. By the way, this is my pre-harvest marketing plan for corn in 2021. Uh, I've got a minimum price objective of four and a quarter in December futures. But if you listen to me on how to get $4 corn, you'll know that I might be willing to start earlier than that. Uh, as we uh, started the morning, these 21 futures are trading at 409 a bushel. And uh, it's tempting. I hope, uh, I hope if you haven't thought about it yet, I hope you get 2021 on your radar. Soybeans, uh, uh, I've got a minimum price objective of 975 in November futures. Now my plans start on January 21 of this year, a month from now, three weeks from now. Uh, but the NOV 21 contract is already trading at 1040 a bushel. Um, I'm probably going to be in here. I know you're reading all the bullish news that I'm reading about the soybean market and incredible sales to China, carryouts dipping down, a lot of good things happening. Uh, soon enough, the market will start thinking about prospects in 2021. And uh, if you don't think that with soybean prices where they are, we might not pull another five, six, seven million acres into bean production in 2021. I, I think again, I think that's going to happen. That doesn't mean we immediately go into a bear market, but that's looming out ahead. And uh, take a hard look at these opportunities for 2021 now. Uh, my guess is that uh, Karen. Uh, when this is all done, her, her, this virtual uh, uh, conference, uh, she may ask for some feedback from you about how things are going. I want you to know that you should always be blunt in your reviews. I ask my students every year to give me uh, feedback on the course they've taken from me, and I just share some comments to inspire you uh, when this is all done. These are real comments. Uh, one student said, my favorite class taken in four years at the U of M. That's, uh, it's always nice to get a compliment. Uh, please move the class to the afternoon so I don't fall asleep. People, it's not easy to be a 20 year old college student. There are so many opportunities every evening that it's hard to get up for a morning class. Thankfully, this year it's been virtual, so they've been listening to me in their underwear, and it's much easier. Fast Eddie was genuinely the most helpful and informative instructor I've had in my learning career, which is a wonderful um, uh, kudos going in my direction. I just can't figure out where the Fast Eddie came from. I've never introduced myself to Fast Eddie. You'll note that this morning I did say did not thank Karen and say, here comes Fast Eddie. But some student thinks I'm Fast Eddie. And finally, you may agree with this one more than any other. The instructor was rather scatterbrained and confused about the content. That remains my personal favorite comment uh, over 20 years of teaching. Okay. Um, I'm ready to take some questions. I hope there are a couple out there. And I want to thank Karen for putting together this uh, virtual crop management input seminar. Yeah, thank you. Um, so far, we must have a pretty quiet group. I, there was a comment about not having coffee and donuts this morning. And so maybe we're, we're just getting rolling here this morning. But Right now, there are no comments in the Q&A, so if you do have a comment, please utilize the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask us a question here. Ed is open to answering those. Um, I guess one question I have for you, Ed, is, you know, what are some, you know, the most common mistake that you see farmers making across Minnesota when it comes to getting their grain marketed effectively? 
Well, I don't know if there is one particular one, but I do, I do, I'm thinking of um, Aunt Tilly here and her pre-harvest marketing. There are still people who are very reluctant to market before harvest. And, um, you know, every, all the evidence I see says that over time, not every time, but over time, uh, some of your best opportunities show up before harvest. And I hope people are looking ahead to 2021. And after harvest, you know, I don't mind saying that Hank Holder appears to be one of the favorite characters I put out there. Holding grain too long is, uh, boy, it's an interesting uh, kind of bad habit in parts of, uh, of the upper Midwest. One problem we have in the Northern Plains is we have this thing called winter which allows us to store grain a long time. It kills bugs, you know, and you can keep the grain, you know, if you're smart in good condition. That doesn't necessarily mean you should keep it that long, but unfortunately it allows us to keep it that long. So if I could bust people of a bad habit, it's holding that grain too long. Okay, we do have a couple of questions coming in here. First is, is there hope for the ethanol market to turn around in the near future? Um, boy, uh, it's, it's the ethanol market and corn going into ethanol. That's, you're, asking a, you're asking me to offer a prognostication on the fossil fuel market, on, on gasoline and heating oil. And frankly, your guess is as good as mine. I got a neighbor driving a Tesla. I've driven a Prius for the last 10 years. The gas consumption is uh, trending lower and will continue to do so. Do I think the ethanol market's going away in the next five years? No, I don't, but it's, uh, it's heyday and growth period is uh, probably in the rear view mirror. I had someone else asking what percent of you price for 2021? I haven't yet, but uh, I'm looking at soybeans. Um, uh, that 1040, it has been above 1050 a bushel. I sort of use my discretion before the January one. I just haven't chosen to. But I'll tell you, if, you, if you're fatalistic, about marketing. That is, you think to yourself, every time I sell, the market goes up. Do yourself a favor, make a little sale, trick the market, watch it go up. Small sale won't hurt you. It'll be at a... I'm looking at a question here, Karen. Do the current commodity prices truly represent the low carryout numbers uh, the USDA is posting in their reports. I think so. I think so. Uh, the more interesting carryout numbers are in soybeans. I mean, we are really taking the carryout way down. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a $11 plus soybeans. We haven't seen that in a long time. The corn carryout, yes, it's under 2 billion bushels. That's interesting, but we're not going to run out corn. Um, it's an interesting level. And uh, we have prices that reflect that right now. I'm reading another question. USDA has seemed slow to adjust numbers to re reflect crop shortfalls. Is this reality or just perception? No, I think USDA is conservative in how they change numbers. Uh, we also get confused during the summer. Uh, we see a crop report come out on August 10th, for example, and we go, the crop's not that good. Well, there, that August 10th re report reflects August 1 conditions, and a lot can happen in those 10 days. That's one aspect. Another one is just, that's just the USDA's way to be a little conservative. Uh, I'll give you another example, very interesting one recently. They were very slow to adjust their ideas of Chinese corn and soybean imports, particularly corn imports. And people are looking at the level of their imports 
and how the exports of U.S. corn are going. And they can't believe the USDA is not even uh, uh, recognizing the higher imports. And they finally did in the last few weeks. And you said, well, why did it take so long? The USDA uh, representative said something very interesting three or four weeks ago, which was um, the Chinese have a history of canceling purchases. And you wanna know something? They do have a history of canceling purchases. I'm not saying they're gonna do it now. The USDA guy was not saying they're gonna do it now. But there have been in years past instances of China stepping in to be very aggressive in purchases of soybeans in particular, but corn, and coming back a month, two months, three months later and canceling them. I'm not saying that's gonna happen this year, but it wasn't a crazy statement at the time. My break even for corn and soybeans, I'm thinking around, um, I think for Southern Minnesota, somewhere around 350, uh, 360, 370 cash price on corn. And uh, on soybeans, uh, $9 a bushel, and we're well above that. Will USDA mandate smaller ethanol blenders to resume I'm just not a policy expert on ethanol. I, I just, I can't answer that. And one last uh, question here, in the long run, does a rearrangement of the supply chain, uh, localization and globalization have a harsh impact on the marketing tendencies you've talked about today? The tendencies I look at, these, these price tendencies, these price patterns are based on the production cycle. Uh, they have held true for decades, as far back as I can go. And uh, my response uh, to changing patterns is uh, uh, when you tell me, when, when, when Minnesota farmers start planting corn in January and harvesting in June, I will speak to a changing pattern. But as long as you plant in the spring and harvest in the fall, the patterns I've showed you, I believe will continue to hold. All right, thank you, Ed. We do have one other question that popped up into our chat. Um, any thoughts on best alternative uses for corn or soybeans, such as plastic or other products that are looking promising? Um, uh, plastics uh, uh, are out there. They've been developed. Um, and the, we use the soybean in so many different ways to just talk about oil and meal is, is shortchanging all that's going on. The challenge, of course, is the al these alternative uses just aren't huge. They tend to be smaller niche markets, but well, they, they, they've got a number of them already developed and they're exploring more. Well, thank you, Ed. We appreciate your time this morning and sharing some more insight with us on some marketing tips uh, here in the future and, and what it looks like moving forward. So thank you again for your time and sharing uh, some thoughts with us here this morning. Okay, thank you, Karen, and good luck to everyone in 2021. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome another one of our Gold Star sponsors, Jeff Borsma from Bex Seed, to introduce our next speaker. So Jeff, if you want to turn your camera on. Camera's not working this morning, um, Karen, but uh, good morning, okay. everybody. As Karen mentioned, my name is Jeff Borsma. I'm the district sales manager with Bex Hybrids in West Central Minnesota. And we're always happy to help sponsor the U of M Crop Input Seminar. Uh, at Bex, we understand that every farm is different and with every field, it has unique needs, which is why we are dedicated to providing farmers with tools and resources they are needed to succeed. Bex has the most genetically diverse product offering in the industry of high performing products. 
Um, one thing that's unique about our fastest growing seed brand is we still have a family owned seed company. Uh, they're extremely passionate in doing what is right for the farmer. And Sonny Beck will always say they don't do something in their business as long as it doesn't make sense for the farmer. Whatever direction that they go, it must make sense for the farmer's success. Our mission is to provide our customers with the best seed quality, field performance, and service. Locally in the McLeod area, um, we've got a Beck Steeler, Gerald Kuchera. He's been there for many years. Uh, he lives in Silver Lake. You can definitely reach out to Gerald at 320-894-0456 for your 2021 soybean, corn, or alfalfa needs. At this time, I'd like to introduce the second speaker, Bruce Potter. Bruce received a Bachelor of Science degree in 1979 and Master of Science in 1984 in entomology from the University of Minnesota. Since 1997, he has served as an extension IPM or integrated pest management specialist at the University of Minnesota at the South West Research and uh, Outreach Center in Lamberton, Minnesota. His current research and extension efforts focus primarily on the management of pests of corn and soybeans. In addition to his research and extension articles, he has published a growing season uh, Southwestern Minnesota IPM newsletter since 1999. Bruce has helped countless farmers across Minnesota, along with myself, in identifying insects and giving recommendations to help manage pests in our crop. Let's welcome Bruce Potter as he shares more about insect and disease issues for 2021. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, I will uh, try to start uh, sharing my screen here. Can you guys see my screen at all? We're seeing your computer. So like That's the good. desktop of your computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's always funny. The, the more and more we test this out ahead of time, the more and more it doesn't quite go right. So <laughs> gotta love technology. There you go, you're getting it. There we go. All right, well, um, appreciate you guys having me on the program today and uh, see if I can get my laser pointer going here. I've got three screens here. It's uh, kind of a challenge to move around. If you have questions, uh, you know, I can, I've got some things I want to talk about, but uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not all that uh, confined uh, to the slides I've got. So feel free to, to interact. There we go. Um, we had some interesting pest issues in uh, 2020, um, you know, things that haven't been around for a while. Uh, some some uh, soybean gall, or excuse me, um, some uh, spider mites and, and uh, tar spot moving, in, uh, expanding its area in Minnesota, not so much in, in central Minnesota, but in the southeast. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those today. And the topics I am going to talk about, uh, there'll be more information, more webinars uh, during the during the uh, winter season here. So I'm just going to give some highlights. And the first one I want to mention is uh, soybean gall midge. And we'll talk about what it is real briefly, uh, you know, changes in distribution, um, maybe some few things we might have learned in last summer. If you look at this picture, um, this looks a lot like uh, disease in the field. 
if you peel back this outer layer or bark of the soybean plant, um, uh, on the outside and both on the inside, you'll see a real dark, uh, basically a black discoloration where the healthy and, and affected tissue are. This is a real early infestation. These larvae are still white. Um, and as they grow, they'll, they'll turn uh, orange. And uh, Karen, you want to ask the first question? Guys, take your, your best shot, and hopefully by the time I get done talking about soybean gall midge, you'll, you'll have a pretty, pretty good idea. The correct answer is not Nebraska. Let me know, Karen, when, when we're ready to go again. Um, we've got about 50% of the people have uh, voted. So maybe a couple more seconds here. Give people a chance to finish reading through everything. Let's go ahead and end the poll. Uh, well, the answer is either A or A or B. Um, I'll talk about the others, uh, others as we go through the, the uh, real briefly. Uh, somebody else's farm, but uh, really it's something that uh, everybody should start looking for, is uh, because. Uh, you know, this, this is, has the potential to be a, a real major yield robber in soybeans. Um, brand new insect to science, uh, for, had, uh, was identified and, and uh, the name and the description published in uh, spring of 2019. Uh, pretty distinctive larvae, they're orange. Uh, again, these are underneath that epidermis. Notice this black uh, layer right here. This is from Rock County in 2019. Here's the adult. Uh, adult you'll ever see these in the field. Uh, the only time I've seen them is actually in emergence cages. As much time as I spent in gall midge infest infested fields, I've not seen an adult in the wild. We have a little bit of a problem in that uh, it was actually misidentified by, by the taxonomist. Um, and, and, but there's another insect that's on soybeans. It's also a, in the gall midge family. It's the white mold gall midge. And this actually is feeding on the fungus itself. If you see this insect, the way you can tell the difference between this and soybean gall midge is, you know, distribution, it'll be kind of scattered through the field wherever white mold is. It'll be on the outside of the plant, inside of the plant, in the pods. Um, you know, wherever, wherever white mold is. And even if that white mold fungus itself is not there anymore, um, you know, that, that association with white mold is kind of a, a, a good key. Here's the adult of this. And again, it's pretty, it's pretty small. The only place I've seen them is in emergence cages. So <laughs> this is not a disease. And I think this is, uh, you know, there's a lot, maybe more of this out there than people realize. It looks just like uh, any other root rot uh, from, uh, from a distance. Um, in July, that first uh, generation of larvae will cause these plants, heavily infested plants to start wilting. And if you look at the base, you'll see the damage. Again, that's where the larvae are gonna uh, be hanging out. This is a field in Rock County in fall. Um, last year's soybeans was, were off to the right. And you can see this edge where they move in, that edge gets heavily colonized early. They're all the way out in the field, 100 yards out or so, and we have uh, plants that are brittle and have the potential to break off. But you'll usually see this big, uh, big uh, area where you've got dead plants on the edge of the field, or that's, that's where the damage will be most severe. It's kind of the current, the known distribution of soybean gall midge. Uh, 
This actually was first reported in 2015 in South Dakota and also in Nebraska in 2011, but it was assumed to be uh, you know, associated with uh, injured or diseased soybeans. 2018, it blew up in, in central Nebraska and eastern uh, or western Iowa, and we realized that this could infest soybeans all by itself. Rock County, we had our first report in 2018, but the farmer also had, uh, had sent some samples in that had been misidentified. It had been here at least in, since 2016, looking at yield maps, probably a little longer than that. Um, once we became aware of it, we, found, we started seeing more uh, infested counties. And um, in, in 2020, we picked up some, some fields further north, Traverse and Swift County. This was well, all, close to the river, uh, northwest of Wheaton. Had a lot of people out looking for soybean gall midge. We had a North Central soybean uh, uh, sponsored uh, uh, survey. And, you know, the green are the good sign, are good to know because we kind of have an idea where it isn't. One isolated field in 20, uh, 2019 in Faribault County. Here's where our initial infestations were. And this West Central or along this Northern Minnesota River Valley, um, that's where it's, we, we can find it uh, pretty commonly, but, but uh, yield loss and, and heavily infested fields are still fairly rare up there. What, ha what we're noticing is if you find an infested field, usually you can find it in, in nearby fields. Uh, there's, so there's, they're kind of aggregated and, and certain geographies tend to have, have uh, the, the midge found. Again, it's those field edges adjacent to last year's soybeans is where we see the damage the worst. If there's perennial vegetation, a, a, a road, grass roadway or a ditch or something like that, uh, in between that seem, or, or, or bushes or something like that, that seems to uh, increase the odds of finding the midge. And it may be they're using that for a windbreak or shelter or they're, they're aggregating in there for mating. Um, there's other factors that could be involved. Variety tillage uh, is one of the things we're looking at. Why is it where it's at? And if you want, there's a, a survey on uh, uh, that you can participate in. It doesn't matter if you have gall midge or not. We're trying to see if we can correlate uh, where these infestations are with, with different types of tillage. There's other hosts, sweet clover and alfalfa, and we're looking for more. And again, Fortunately, in Minnesota, the fields with economic damage are still limited. Hopefully, they stay that way. Um, this is an insecticide trial we did last year. I'm going to show you the yield results. This is on the edge of a field, so the infestations are, were fairly heavy. Uh, some of these are experimental. Here's no treatment. Here's our best treatments, and I'll show you what those are in a minute. Um, because of multiple generations, we're still talking 15 bushel soybeans where we've, where we've put on multiple insecticide applications, which is not good. And for some reason, I lost a whole slide. Basically what's happening is, is if you can control the first generation, you get, a, you get some control uh, benefit, but unfortunately, multiple generations um, it's hard to time that insecticide and those in, that emergence is over a long period of time. Okay. I'm going to ask a question on, uh, on fungicides. Need to be done by 1010, don't I, Karen? Um, we've got a little wiggle room. Um, we did go over a little bit with our first presentation. So if you're done by um, 1020, we should be fine. Okay. 
looks like we have 62% of participants that have answered. Maybe That's just... good. The, the others are probably sleeping. <laughs> we will show the results here. Ah, that's bright, bright group. I think I think we've got it. Um, we'll uh, I'll go through some results uh, of a, of a long term study we've got, and and uh, hopefully reinforce that what you guys are reporting. This picture here is a uh, 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 Circospora leaf blight, and it's uh, you know something that's popped up. It's always been around, but it's more of a southern disease. But we're seeing more and more of it in in Minnesota. This one is actually has some resistance to the triazole fungicide, so um, it's it's a little more difficult to control if if uh, if you have it in the field. What we've had for several years is a is a uh, study where we're applying a couple fungicides to uh, multiple corn hybrids, and this the chart's really confusing, but. Uh, I'm just going to point out what's what's on it. We've got um, the location and the year. We've got several fungicide, astrobilurin by itself, that would be headline, astrobilurin plus a trial, it's triazole, one example, it changed from year to year. Uh, one, the, one of those is Delero. And then we've got astrobilurin plus an SDHI, and in, and in our studies, this is a Preaxer. These numbers uh, are, are what the advantage of that particular fungicide uh, in, in that year and that location was over the untreated check. And this looks like a huge difference. This, this looks like a small difference. If they're not bold, there's no statistical difference. There's just that much variability in there. You can't really sort things out. Here's an example in Lamberton in 2018 where we did have a, a significant response, not huge. And where we do have responses, we looked at $3, $4, and $5 corn, because we're optimists. And we calculated out the, the uh, benefit from having that fungicide application on there. If you guys that like to play with numbers, I left these in here, but I caution you that there's a very good possibility those differences are not real. So here's kind of as of course as you expect as your as your uh, price goes up your your return for saving bushels increases. The thing that's not in this these numbers are fungicide costs or application costs, and some of these fungicides are running close to, to twenty bucks of just for an acre just for the treatment. Okay, so that's not very uh, not very good odds. And we've also have sites in uh, Morris and Crookston that I didn't show here because of different uh, hybrids. But we're looking at 10 out of 11 of those years had at least one of those fungicide with a positive uh, response. Doesn't mean it's real. If we look at things where we're confident that we've got a response, these are rotated corn always, one out of 11 site years. The average in the south is 0.7 bushels. The biggest increase we saw, again, not statistic, statistically different is 12.9, okay? Not huge. So what about 2020 in the mix? Again, we didn't get any response to fungicide. At, uh, we, we cut down the number of locations because of travel restrictions for COVID, but we did have Lamberton and Rosemont. Um, three varieties at each site. We also added rot, uh, continuous corn. This is Lamberton. Um, Lamberton, this is Rosemont. For each variety, this is the rotated uh, yield. This is our um, continuous corn yield or corn on corn yield. So we're looking at, uh, you know, between all those sites, a 20, uh, 14 to 20% reduction in yield for rotated, for not rotating corn. That, that uh, is not all that unusual, I guess. We expect 10%, but there's been a lot of guys complaining about huge differences this year. And what these studies are telling us is that that difference and that increased difference probably is not due to any kind of uh, foliar diseases that we can control. So what about soybeans? Look at all the yellow. Um, Responses are a lot more consistent in soybeans. 
Um, they're not always positive. 2017 was, uh, you know, we didn't get much of a response. Um, but overall, in the southern part of the state, soybeans are responding very well, or very often. In the northern part of the state, um, Crookston, Morris, uh, it's, it's much, we're not seeing the, the same amount of response. We look at overall 11 out of 12 sites had at least one uh, numerically positive result. I guess I, don't, I ignore those. Eight out of 12 um, in the South, 12, 10 out of 16 in the South had, or in, you know, overall had at least one of those two fungal sites. Significant. So that's, that's fairly good odds. The uh, mean increase was 3.2 bushels in the south, and the maximum increase in those southern sites was 6.2 bushels. So it's something to consider. The other thing I'm going to point out is in both corn and soybeans, we tend to see a difference in moisture. And in, that, in fact, the, the uh, fungicide treated uh, plots are a little bit wetter. And some of this yield difference may not have anything to do with disease. It may have to do with harvestability, a little, little moisture grain and a little less shatter. And again, just because these sites are significant uh, doesn't mean that they're economic. You may not, you know, you've got to, you've got to factor in uh, application and, and fungicide on in, in, in your return. Soybeans, uh, 2020. Two sites, or Lamberton was the only site we had this year. And again, we got pretty good responses and pretty consistent responses. On the left is our check. This is Preax or this is Delario, Delero. And here's our three varieties. They all responded. Our moisture was real low when we got out through the combine these this year. And we don't have a, a, a significant difference for moisture uh, by fungicide. We do by variety, of course, because of maturity. So we do have a couple questions for you, Bruce, that have popped up. So the first is, um, so this was based on the corn fungicide. Were those applications done at uh, VT? Uh, between VT and R2, uh, we tried to do it at VT because of the, uh, uh, but, but because of, you know, they're not all exactly the same maturity. And because of weather, we couldn't always time things perfectly, but, but they were, they were, there was uh, a targeted at VT. Yes. And then the other question that's on here is, is there a possibility of developing a formula to predict a more uniform or more profitable response, uh, response to fungicides? Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, one thing I'm going to say right up front is that I'm not, these results for corn, uh, do not mean that the fungicides don't aren't effective on controlling disease. These trials were not put on super sensitive hybrids. They weren't put in high disease pressure situations. They were just, you know, as if you'd ram, randomly go out and, and pick a cornfield and decide whether you're going to put a fungicide on it or not. But I think uh, one of the things to look at is weather. And I think before you put a fungicide on, looking at the crop itself, if you don't see any foliar disease out there at VT, um, your odds of something blowing up bad enough to hurt yield uh, keep going down the further you get into the season. And you can apply fungicides after VT for that matter too, if you want to wait a little bit. I think eventually we're going to have uh, some be uh, better models or be able to incorporate disease development models uh, in this as well. And the other thing to look at is uh, the seed companies themselves do a lot of testing and, and some of these hybrid, particularly corn hybrids tend to respond. I think uh, my guess is looking at, at, at some data is it may have to do with uh, stock strength. Um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the benefit uh, that when guys are seeing responses is that little bit wetter corn uh, you don't start to see the stock breakdown quite as quick and you, you, can get, if you can get more of that harvested. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, and then there was another, I think it's more of a comment that came in saying weather and hybrid tolerance to the disease, NCLB, and if it's corn on corn versus corn on soybean. 
Correct. That the first uh, up through 2019, uh, and I mentioned and I mentioned the susceptibility, the hybrid. Um, just mentioned that, but the corn on corn, uh, corn on uh, first th through 2019, those studies were all on rotated corn, and we just started looking at uh, um, non-rotated corn uh, this year. We didn't see a, 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 a difference in uh, response, uh, but overall disease was very low this year. It was a it was a good year for corn and and a not so good year for for uh, corn diseases. Okay. All right, we're going to hit corn rootworm, and there'll be a, a webinar later on to go into the details. I just want to point out some things that I think are important. We've got some western corn rootworm beetles uh, feeding on corn silks to the right or to the left here. We've also got another species, northern corn rootworm, that's the all, all green beetle. Here's what's happening. Western corn be rootworm beetles have been increasing over the last few years. Um, they dropped because of a severe winter uh, in 2014, but they've been building since. And we've got some horrible problems out there this year and huge populations and not mostly in non-rotated corn for both species. We do have some problems in that um, we're seeing more and more resistance in Westerns. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, performance, uh, unexpected uh, performance problem fields with uh, BT pyramids. It's not just the cry B3 BB1 anymore, so that's kind of concerning. We're having to, there's some, uh, you know, some of the RNAi uh, uh, traits that are on the horizon, but they're going to still need some sort of working BT in front of them to be uh, really effective. And uh, the nor even now in Northerns, there's re resistance to BT reported. In fact, uh, there's some pretty good evidence that uh, in Meeker County that we've got some issues going on there. Okay, and, and uh, so it's not, this is, this is a serious thing. And uh, for Westerns, the easiest thing to do is take the field out of corn for a year. Don't let any volunteer corn go and they'll starve to death. Uh, Northerns are a little more complicated because of extended diapause. But this is a study we had at Lamberton this year. This is uh, what we've got left for root systems. This is uh, all Western corn rootworm at this site. And if we look at different traits, we've got uh, you know, uh, no, no rootworm BT here. We've got a smart stack here. This is an acre max extreme, which is a, which is a pioneer pyramid two BT traits, and here's, a, here's the Syngenta pyramid. The left bar is by itself, the right bar, we're adding an insecticide. And we can see that we've got a, a, a benefit that's still, it's still a lot of feeding here where an insecticide is because of this extreme pressure. Here's the problem we've got over here with some of the AgriSure Duracade uh, traded hybrids. The two rootworm genes that they have uh, in that hybrid, there's cross resistance to CRY3BB1, and CRY3BB1 is the one that was in yield guard in VT triple, and that's the initial one that we had uh, resistance to. Uh, looks like we've got pretty good control with these two pyramids yet. The problem I want to point out is over here on the yield side. You know, we're, if your trait's working, and it's working really well, you shouldn't see any response to uh, uh, an insect insecticide added. In this case, we're adding, uh, adding uh, um, Aztec uh, HC. And you shouldn't see a response in yield. Here's the problem. Although they're small, everything's got a little yield bump from adding a, rootworm, a good rootworm insecticide. And that's a little bit concerning. It's telling me that either because of extreme high pressure or we're starting to see a higher frequency of resistant uh, larvae in the population, these things are starting to struggle. So it's something we're really going to have to pay attention to. Thing I want other thing I want to point out on, on the rootworm uh, side is um, if you've got a really serious rootworm problem, 
there's a limited amount of insecticides that are going to work. I wouldn't, you know, they're great for low populations, that sort of thing. I wouldn't mess around with things like capture and ap uh, ampex in furrow. Force and index are a little bit better, but even this year at this location on an on a untraded hybrid, those did not hold up very well. So um, if, you've got it, if you've got a serious rootworm issue, um, don't mess around with it. And again, if it's Westerns, the best thing you can do is rotate that field out of corn for a year. Last topic of the day, and I'll get done pretty close to time here. I'm just going to make a question, brief. Bruce, that came What's in. That? Yeah. Um, somebody asked, what was the insecticide you used with the traded hybrid? Oh, yeah, I, I thought I mentioned that. It, it, that, it was a granular uh, Aztec, Aztec HC. It's a high concentration Aztec. And it's, that's, that's a pretty consistent uh, insecticide. Um, there's a couple of, some of the granules are, 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 are pretty consistent. All right, did we talk about, I just want to mention corn borer. It uh, hasn't gone extinct. The good news is populations are down and they're even down from 2019. They're not zero, and this map's a little misleading. It's just the number of corn borer larvae that they're found, uh, we're finding in the fall that uh, would overwinter. And we've got some fields with tunnels, but there were no larvae left in them. So it's, 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 this isn't uh, necessarily a reflection on yield loss from corn borers, just what's going on in the winter. But they're down from last year. They kind of collapsed in Northwest Minnesota. Uh, they're down in west central Minnesota. Uh, part of that's because there's, there's still some, probably because there's still some uh, biocontrols that are active and things like Nosema and some of the parasitoid wasps that have been introduced to control corn borer um, have helped knock that population down. So we, in the old days, before BT, we used to see these high populations and then, then populations had crashed because of uh, disease and parasitism, and even looks like even at these low populations, the, that's still going on. The thing I wanna point out in corn borer is, this does not mean you have zero risk. I think it's, you can take a little breath and maybe uh, um, not panic about things getting out of hand right now. But if you've got a history in your area of a lot of fields without BT, it's something you still need to pay attention to and scout. And on the internet at the Lamberton website, and I think it's uh, up on the extension website as well, I've got an Excel spreadsheet you can download and it, it, you can plug numbers in, tells you how to scout, that sort of thing. And it'll give you some, some uh, help in calculating economic thresholds. So that's all I had. I kind of blew through there kind of quickly. Uh, hopefully uh, gives you a little little perspective, maybe some ideas as, plan, uh, as far as picking varieties for next summer, that sort of thing. And if you have any questions and there's any time left, um, I'll sure like to take them. Um, we do have a, a couple of minutes here. So if people have some lingering questions or some questions about um, perhaps another topic that you guys wanted to hear about in terms of IPM, you know, please put it in the Q&A box, uh, what that question is, and we'll see, see what we can do to answer those questions here. I've managed to put them to sleep. I, I guess so. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Bruce, before we uh, get ready for our break here? Uh, no, I think, uh, well, I think I would want to mention is the fungicide studies uh, up till 2019, they are on, uh, there, there was a crop news article, so that's still on the web. We'll update that and we're going to update the, uh, the uh, uh, corn borer prediction uh, publication yet this month and have that on the web for you. There is, I do have a newsletter that, uh, you know, I try to keep track of what's going on in the field during the summer. So if you have, uh, have questions on, uh, you know, or it's, it, 
I like to get feedback from the field too, as far as what's going on. Um, it, it really, it really helps. There's a lot more eyes out there than, than I've got or my crew has. So appreciate it. Appreciate the interaction. We do have a couple questions going now that uh, we got people thinking. Um, does any uh, early vegetative stage fungicide spray even pay in corn? Um, does early vegetative fungicide spray? I, I, and I haven't worked on this myself and I haven't kept up. I'm actually an entomologist. I just play with fungicides because I got students that need something to do during the summer. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not serious there. Uh, but um, I, I think where, where the early fungicide application is going to pay um, is maybe in, in cases of, of things that are, that are the infections really early. And one that I, I think about right off the top of my head is physoderma. There's a foliar phase and a node rot phase. Um, some guys are putting uh, fungicides on for, for that disease. They think they're getting a pretty good response. And that may be, but if it's a late application, the one trial I've done I, or put on with that, I haven't seen anything. Um, I, what they may be seeing, as I mentioned, that, that moisture difference, a little bit uh, delayed maturity, it may be keeping those stocks standing a little bit longer. But that infection happens in rural, rural stage corn, then it gets into the vascular system of the plant and moves around. And, and that would be a case where maybe a fungicide would pay, but I haven't tested it that well and I haven't kept up on what other researchers are doing with that. That'd be a good question for Dean Melvick. And I think uh, it'll probably be discussed during the, the CPM short course by uh, Allison Robertson from, uh, from Iowa. Uh, long next, saying, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And CPM Short Course Connect is next week for anybody that is interested. Um, check out the extension website for more information on that. Um, lots of questions coming in now. So you got them, got them thinking, Bruce. Uh, is fungicide better in early beans? Uh, not that we can tell. And the thing that, um, thing that seems really remarkable to me is that, is that we're not seeing a lot, we're not seeing any interaction between fungicide and, and variety. In other words, it's not, if, if one variety responds, they usually all do. So it, again, I, I'm wondering if it's actually a disease that we're, we're managing there or something physiological in that plant. Um, but we have had, have diff, had different maturities in our studies and I haven't been able to pick up on anything um, with, any, any differences based on maturity. Maybe, maybe if you're, if you're going to stand out there a little longer, uh, you may get a little bigger bang for the buck, but you're also going to get probably a yield bang if you plant a little fuller season bean too. So it all averages out. Um, as you see gall midge spread, what patterns have you seen that may be impacting the spread of gall midge? bird migration, weather, farm machinery, et cetera? Uh, well, they fly. And so, so I think that's one way they can get around. They may be native and just adapting to soybeans for all we know. Um, like I say, there seems to be an association with um, some other hosts. Maybe uh, the one that I'm concerned about that we're gonna try to, we need to test out is, is dry beans and, and I don't, they're not, I don't think they're going to move by tillage. I'm thinking that maybe tillage, they overwinter as, as larvae and a cocoon in the soil, soil. I'm thinking maybe if you've got an area that does a lot of minimal till, strip till, or, or strip till type stuff or no till um, for both corn and beans, um, that, may, that may increase their survival. That's one of the things we're looking at, but um, doesn't seem to be soil type. Uh, doesn't seem to be necessarily cropping other cropping history other than it's soybeans next door. And the other thing I'm going to mention is 
where we do our, we've been doing our research in, in Rock County, those soybeans have always had an insecticide seed treatment on it. So it doesn't seem like seed treatment, at least the rates we're using is making much of a difference. Um, as we're wrapping up here, we wanna give people a break, but there's one final question. Um, and there's actually another one that I'll, I'll email you separately, but question would be, would a dual application of fungicide be more effective on soybeans because disease begins to set in in July or in June, but we don't apply until R2, R3? Um, well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a response in, in soybeans applying later. Uh, and I think it's, you don't have to protect the entire canopy. Soybeans have a lot of spare leaves. Um, you know, so if you put a fungicide on and it's effective, um, you're going to protect those upper, upper, can, uh, upper leaves probably for 10, um, 10 days or maybe even a little bit longer. And, and I think that's going to get you till that fill stage is further along. Um, I haven't tested it. It might it might be might might pay, but uh, again, you're going to have a double double application cost. You're not going to want to put your fungicide on with the same stuff you're spraying your dicamba with. I'll guarantee you that. All right, Bruce. Thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate your knowledge and sharing with us some of those top concerns in the IPM world moving into 2021. Um, I do have a question that I'll email you that did pop up here um, and hopefully we can get back to them. You did have a comment on Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays from somebody too. So we appreciate that. I got my, I got my Christmas tree in the back, you know. <laughs> yep, we saw that too. We saw that too. So um, everybody, let's take a 10 minute stretch break, uh, stretch out our, Thank you. our legs, go get some coffee. Um, refill here and we'll try to be back. Let's try to reconvene at uh, 1045. Um, let's reconvene at 1040. 1040 everybody and then uh, we will get uh, announce our egg person of the year and move right into our next speaker. So 1040, feel free to leave up your Zoom as you're taking your stretch break. Um, and we'll be back at, at 1040, give you 12 minutes here.
in about five minutes, we'll come back and uh, reconvene. So get your last bit of coffee or if you're getting a snack here, uh, you got about four or five minutes and then we will do our Ag Person of the Year Award for, for the Hutchinson Chamber of Commerce.
All right, everybody, I hope that you uh, enjoyed your break and was able to get up and get some stretches in as we kind of get towards the um, end part of our presentations here this morning. Uh, so first off, I do want to take the opportunity to uh, introduce who our Ag Person of the Year Award is. This is a award given out by the Hutchinson Chamber of Commerce. And we really try to pick somebody that um, highlights just a variety of activities that they've done for the local community and the ag community in specific. So I will share a video here today and um, we hope that you can help us congratulate this year's winner of the um, Ag Person of the Year Award. Surprise Kelly with the award for business person, for a person of the year. Are you ready? Here we go. Kelly Ryder! So I hope that you can help us in congratulating Kelly Reiner uh, as our Ag Person of the Year Award um, and continuing to be positive support for agriculture across our McLeod County area. And with that, um, you know, normally do a little bit bigger presentation, but happy that we were able to surprise her with the award this year. Um, a woman of few words, but happy that uh, we were able to recognize her and her achievements. Next, I would like to introduce one of our uh, other gold level sponsors for the 2021 uh, Crop Management Input Seminar and share a little bit of um, information and video from them. And so if you give me a second here, I will share my screen again. And this is um, Hutchinson Co-op is our uh, gold level sponsor that we are recognizing right now. Drag with Hutchinson Co-op, the agronomy manager at Hutchinson. And I'd like to thank everyone for today's seminar. And we have three fertilizer locations in Arlington, Luster Prairie and Hutchinson. We offer seven fertilizer applicators with uh, airflow in the G5 and recently purchased new RBR. And we have five liquid machines for our post application of liquid. Thank you and have a great day. Hi there, my name is Patrick Bach with Hutchinson Co-op, co-op out of the Arlington division, um, where we have a brand new bulk chemical facility where we offer a variety of different herbicides, fungicides and insecticides from all the major manufacturers. I would like to also take a moment and thank the Hutchinson Chamber of Commerce. Hi, I'm Pete Holbert from Hutchinson Co-op out of Webster Prairie. I'd like to talk about our custom blending services of NP and K fertilizers with micronutrients. We also offer variable rate applications. We have liquid fertilizer starter blends, 28%. And I'd like to finish by saying thank you to the University of Minnesota Extension Service for this educational opportunity. 
Hi, I'm Colin Wilson with the Hutchinson Co-op at Hutchinson. I just want to talk a little bit about our seed. Yeah, for decal, Mazgrel, LG, NK, and Mustang. We offer a full lineup of corn, as well as GTLLs, Extend, Extend Flex, Enlist, and conventional beans. We can treat all the beans here at our bulk facility, as well as deliver them. Just want to thank all of our customers for the last year and all the sales. Hi, I'm Brian Dragner with Hutchinson Co-op. My apologies. Thank you to Hutchinson Co-op for being one of our key sponsors here for the event. I now would like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Fabian Fernandez is an associate professor with the Department of Soil, Water and Climate at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Fernandez was born and raised in Argentina. He uh, earned his PhD at Purdue University in 2006 master's degree and a bachelor's degree from Brighton Young University in 2002 as well as 2000 respectfully. The research and extension education programs that Dr. Fernandez focuses on soil nutrient management and plant mineral nutrition. His current work at the University of Minnesota concentrates uh, primarily on environmental issues related to nutrient management for corn cropping systems. He seeks to identify and implement nutrient management practices that are suitable in terms of both uh, minimizing negative environmental impacts, especially for water quality and improving the crop itself. With that, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Fabian Fernandez as he shares a little bit more about nutrient management for profit and environmental stewardship given today's uh, conditions. I see. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? And see the yep. screen okay? Uh, we do not see your shared screen yet. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Let's see now. You see it now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for uh, this introduction and for the opportunity to uh, be a part of this uh, um, seminar today. Let's see, I'm trying to um, hide some of these things so that I can actually see my screen. Um, sorry about that. Okay. All right. So I'll be talking today about nitrogen management for profitable and environmental stewardship given uh, current conditions. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, here my co-authors. This is a, a project that uh, we did uh, uh, for a number of years. Karina Fabrizi is a researcher in my group. And uh, Jeff Betch is a researcher at the um, Southern Research uh, Now Rich Center in Wasika. And um, let's see, next slide. Nope. Oh, okay. All right. So um, one of the things that um, there is a lot of interest in right now is um, the fact that there are some restrictions uh, on fall nitrogen applications uh, with the new um, water um, ground protection rule. And um, while this is very, very important uh, for, for the audience today in this presentation, it may not be as important just simply because um, there is here a map of uh, kind of the, uh, the part one restrictions for the uh, rule, which are basically uh, no applications of fall nitrogen on, on, or on frozen soils in areas that are vulnerable to groundwater, which are the purple areas in the map. And then uh, also protection areas where are basically public wells uh, with high nitrate concentrations that are the green areas in the map. And so I kind of uh, zoom into the area um, that more or less represents the audience today. And you can see that that's not really, um, for the most part, there are no very many acres that would be impacted by the rule. But that said, 
Um, the uh, focus of my research and what I will be presenting today actually does apply very, very much to, to the audience in this presentation because um, one of the things that we have seen is that uh, in Minnesota, there is a lot more nitrogen uh, being used as urea than anhydrous ammonia. This has changed drastically over the last uh, several years. And um, the challenge with that is that, especially for, for this kind of uh, central part, south central part of the state, um, there being kind of this notion of, well, we change the source of nitrogen, but uh, we'll continue business as usual, doing uh, applications like we did with fall and hydrous ammonia, we'll just switch to urea. And that is, uh, can be very problematic as I'll uh, sh share in a little bit. Uh, along with this change in nitrogen source, we are also seeing that in Minnesota, we are getting wetter. Uh, this is a map of Minnesota showing across the different years how much wetter we are getting uh, over time. The, uh, I'm sorry, I think some of the numbers are cut off, but the, the last map on the right is basically current time. And you can see that we are definitely getting a lot wetter. And for the study, this study was conducted between 2016 and 2019. You can see here for uh, the locations where we did the study, Wasika, Lambert, and Morris, which would be kind of uh, all around uh, your area. And then one additional location in the Northwest in Crookston. You can see that uh, the uh, precipitation, the, the brown bar on the right represents the historic average, the 30 year average. You can see that for all the other years we have had substantial more precipitation than the, the uh, historic average. And so definitely weather uh, conditions. Crookston, not so much. That's kind of a, a drier part of the state. And then the other aspect to that is uh, that we are getting warmer temperatures in the winter, which both these conditions, the additional moisture and the additional temperatures, warmer temperatures, result in more potential for nitrogen loss. And so um, especially with this change of going from anhydrous to urea uh, in earlier applications like fall applications or very, very early sp spring applications, this can result in, in substantial but more potential for nitrogen loss, which is a problem. And so we started this study in 2016. We had a few questions that we wanted to research. Uh, the first one is the time of application. What are the differences between fall versus spring urea applications for corn grain? Second, we were interested in nitrogen sources. Are there benefits using nitrification inhibitors or other nitrogen sources? In other words, uh, can we um, still apply nitrogen in the fall or early, very early in the spring and uh, by changing what source we use? And then nitrogen placement, that's another one where okay, can we do something through placement that may improve the, uh, the chances of having a benefit from this application? So we'll talk about those questions. As I mentioned, we had this study at, across the state in four locations. I kind of highlighted there um, the, the area of the, the attendance for this uh, seminar or this, this um, presentation today, but you can see that uh, War, uh, Morris, Lamberton, and Wasika are kind of there uh, in the general vicinity that can um, represent uh, your conditions. We have in this study, corn uh, four corn uh, growing seasons 2016 through 2019. I actually have one additional year in 2020, but I have not added that information yet. I will actually be talking kind of briefly today about these things during the um, research updates. If any of you attend this uh, event, I'll probably be talking in more depth at, uh, about this study. Um, we have in all of the locations, we had continuous corn and corn soybean. We also had a corn wheat rotation uh, for some of the years at the Crookston location. And, and so in terms of looking at the effect of nitrogen rate and time of application on corn yield, we basically had a response curve. Uh, you see there the, the different nitrogen rates uh, for um, continuous corn. And then um, for corn soybean or corn wheat, so going from a check plot with no nitrogen all the way to 200 pounds or 240 pounds in the continuous corn. And we are using uh, urea as a broadcast and incorporated application, both in fall and in spring. So we can do a complete comparison of those two timings. 
The other uh, set of treatments that we have in this study is a comparison of different nitrogen sources. We have anhydrous ammonia, urea, urea plus instinct, which is a nitrification inhibitor, and environmental smart nitrogen or ESN, which is a polymer coated urea. And again, for all of these, we have the comparison of fall versus spring. For these particular comparisons, we are only using one rate of nitrogen uh, as in both cases is a suboptimum end rate of 120 pounds for continuous corn or uh, 80 pounds for the corn soybean or corn wheat rotation. The reason we are using these suboptimal rates is because we want it to be in the most responsive portion of the response curve so that if there was a difference due to these uh, different sources, we'll be able to pick it up Pretty easily. Um, the uh, only difference in here is that uh, for anhydrous ammonia, we could only apply 120 pounds uh, because of restrictions with the equipment that we have. And so we would only be able to make a comparison of anhydrous ammonia to urea broadcast uh, because for that treatment, we have 80 and 120 pounds, but the others only 80. So it would not be a fair comparison for those. And then the uh, other thing is looking at inhibitors and placement and methods. So we have urea versus urea plus instinct with uh, urea instinct uh, is this uh, nitrification inhibitor. Um, and then uh, again, fall and spring. And then the two comparisons of placement are the broadcast and incorporated treatments or a subsurface band application. Again, both fall and spring. And all of these were again done at just one rate of nitrogen. So let's uh, jump into the results, looking at the end rate first. So with the uh, different nitrogen rates that we had, you can do a, a regression or, or a response curve for fall and spring applications. And you can do that, you know, in this particular case, this is just showing 2019 for the different locations and the different curves that we get. And then you can apply some economics to that to determine basically the point at which you optimize the, uh, the benefit, the economic return on that investment. So basically that last pound of nitrogen that you apply gave you enough of a yield increase to pay for that nitrogen. Above that point, you may not increase yield and definitely not uh, improve uh, returns on the investment. So we did that for all the locations and all the, all the years and um, My computer is kind of frozen here, one sec. We could see your mouse a, a second ago. I don't know where it is now. Yeah, but it says that it's not responding. I have no idea. Uh, let me stop sharing and let me start again and see if that solve the problem. All right, let's try this again. Okay. 
gotta love technology. It's perfect as we think it works. You know, every once in a while, there's that little thing. So no problems. Okay. All right. Can you see the screen again? Yep. We are on a, a chart with Wasika rotation time. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I have no idea. This is the first time that this happens. So um, anyway, so we did this for all of the years and sites. And so basically we came up with um, a, a list of um, location, rotations, and years where we can look at the economic optimum end rate, the EONR, and then the EONR yield um, for each one of these locations. And so this is kind of a summary across all the years for Wasika, for instance. And so we did that for all of them. And then this table here shows basically a summary of all of these where you can see the maximum return to nitrogen and the yield at that maximum return to nitrogen um, as an average across all of these uh, sites and years for fall versus spring. And what you can see clearly is that there is um, definitely a, a benefit for spring applications compared to a fall application. In every one of these locations uh, and uh, crop rotations, we see a benefit where we needed less nitrogen. So a negative number means that's the less amount that we need compared to a false application. For instance, at Wasika, we needed 36 pounds less nitrogen for a spring application. And we produce more bushels, 12 more bushels per acre compared to a fall application. And you can see those values across the different locations. And then across all of the state, basically we are finding that we needed 29 pounds less nitrogen to, to produce nine bushels more yield with the spring application compared to a fall application. And so, um, and you can see that for the most part, it's very consistent. There were a couple of situations where um, maybe the fall versus spring was not very different, uh, but in most cases, there were substantial differences. As, and, and on average, uh, there are definitely some pretty important benefits. And then looking at end timing also, um, one of the things that we did here, this is, so that was for the response curves across all the rates. Now what I'm doing is just simply averaging the yield across all the end rates. So these yields are lower simply because I have some suboptimum end rates, including the check flutter that has no nitrogen. So an average across all of these. And what we did is again, compare fall versus spring uh, for the different, um, for the different uh, uh, fall versus spring for the different rotations and locations and so on. And I highlighted in here the, the ones that were significantly different. So A, B shows that they're uh, statistically different, that there was an important or big difference in there. And so doing that, then we can look at kind of average across all of them to make it easier to see. And we again see that uh, substantial differences between corn, uh, continuous corn and corn soybean in Wasika. In Lamberton, in continuous corn, we saw that those differences, not, not so much in the corn soybean, and then in Morris, again, at the continuous corn. In Crookston, we didn't see as much difference. I mean, you can see that uh, there are slightly numerically greater differences, but um, no statistical differences there. Again, when we just look across all the end rates. So again, just another way to look at the data to, to symbolize that uh, really and truly a fall application with urea is probably not the best situation, especially as you move uh, to the south central part of the state. And then when we look at nitrogen sources, uh, so again, we did that kind of a study again where we are doing all these comparisons. And what I'm showing here is basically a summary of all the possible comparisons. And so what you see here is anhydrous ammonia, uh, different scenarios that I created. Anhydrous ammonia is greater than urea broadcast and incorporated for fall versus spring. Out of the 30 comparisons that we could do in this study, where everything is except, the same except the source, uh, in the fall 18 times out of 30 or 60% or of the time, we saw an improvement. And for those that were uh, a benefit, we see a 19 or a 49 bushel increase with anhydrous ammonia versus urea broadcast and incorporated in the fall. So this is really and truly showing that anhydrous ammonia is a much, much better source than urea for fall applications. If we look at it in the spring, you can again see what the benefit was 
10 out of 31 possible comparisons that we had in study were uh, beneficial. That was 32% of the time, 45 bushel increase for those that were uh, uh, a benefit. And then these ones in red represent situations where it's the opposite. Instead of being anhydrous ammonia better than urea broadcast and incorporated is the other way around where urea actually was better. So in one out of those 31 comparisons, urea actually performed better than anhydrous ammonia for whatever reason. Um, and then you have other situations where we compare anhydrous ammonia, for instance, compared to urea subsurface band, uh, fall and spring, uh, ESN compared to urea broadcast and incorporated again, fall and spring, and then ESN compared to anhydrous ammonia. And in reality, what, what you see out of all of these is really that anhydrous ammonia compared to urea broadcast and incorporated is the one where we see the most difference. All the others, we don't really see as much of a difference. Um, and poss possibly also uh, the um, anhydrous ammonia versus urea subsurface band. So subsurface banding urea helps a little bit, especially for the fall, but not that much. And so, um, that's kind of in general what you would expect. And this is, I think, very important because it helps us to realize, okay, what is the chance that this practice, uh, this timing or this placement will make a difference? And we see that again, anhydrous ammonia for foul applications uh, continue to be kind of the gold standard. Everything else falls uh, short. And then looking at the inhibitors. So here we have a comparison of uh, urea as urea plus the inhibitor versus uh, urea. So the, the uh, scenario here is that urea plus the inhibitor produce greater yields than urea. And um, when we do that analysis, you can see again, uh, across all the possible comparisons, we don't have as many comparisons that we could do in here in the study. You see that it's pretty minimal. One, one out of seven for fall, and actually the opposite in the spring where actually urea was better than urea plus the inhibitor. Uh, none in the fall for Lambert and uh, one opposite where urea actually was better than urea plus the inhibitor and so on. So you can see that the inhibitor, uh, this nitrification inhibitor really provides no benefit. Um, you know, we could think of, okay, if I apply urea in the fall and I use an inhibitor then I can uh, be protecting my nitrogen and do a better job with it. And the data just simply does not support that. And then in terms of uh, placement, here we are looking at urea as a subsurface band versus a, versus a broadcast and incorporated application. What we were trying to do in here is say, okay, urea, we know it's problematic in terms of uh, as much contact as it has with the soil, uh, the more contact it has, the, the worse it is in terms of the microbes really uh, transforming urea to ammonium and then to nitrate. Uh, and so by banding the fertilizer, the idea is can we limit the amount of soil to fertilizer contact and improve things? And you can see there that uh, uh, in general, the, the subsurface band was slightly better in some conditions but, but again, not substantial. I mean, um, four out of seven for was sick in the fall, uh, six out of eight in the fall for um, Lamberton, and one out of six in Morris. So, okay for the fall. Uh, in the spring, really no benefit whatsoever. And so, but still, when you look at these things, uh, even though they may look like, well, you know, it's, it's better, just remember that when we compare urea to, let's say, anhydrous ammonia for the fall application, whether we are subsurface surface banding or broadcast and incorporating urea, the yields were always substantially lower than anhydrous ammonia. So even though we may be able to improve things a little bit for fall applications with this subsurface band of urea, we are still falling way short than, than anhydrous ammonia. And so uh, unfortunately having this um, placement as a way to kind of manage things differently to improve things is not sufficient. Uh, and so in summary, and um, Karen, I, 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 I kind of lost track of my time because I had to restart my timing again, but I think I probably uh, I'm about out of time, but uh, 
in summary, uh, my, my um, recommendations or suggestions based from this study is that uh, polyurea is really a problematic uh, situation because of wet springs and warm falls and winters that we are having. So uh, this was reevaluating the best management practices, especially for Western Minnesota, we have in the best management practices that urea in the fall is a, an acceptable practice. But in reality, because of all these changes that we are seeing in the climate, it really is not. I mean, we lose too much nitrogen and we reduce the yields, the, uh, the return on the investment. Um, so remember that as maybe somebody wants to sell you fall urea, um, it's not the same as anhydrous ammonia. You will not get the same results as you would with anhydrous ammonia. Uh, and then when we look at all variables equal, Spring applications produce more grain than the fall application. That was very clear in the data from, from these studies. Um, as I mentioned, urea or anhydrous ammonia is superior to urea, especially for the fall applications. And unfortunately, the banding of urea as a sub subsurface band or using ESN in the fall, um, it has some advantage, but it's pretty limited. So unfortunately, there is not something that is a silver bullet to say, well, you know, we can do this or that differently to, to make it uh, work better for us. So, uh, and then the other thing is the inhibitors. Uh, we saw no benefit whatsoever in using these nitrification inhibitors. And I think part of the reason for that is that the inhibitors protect nitrogen from nitrification for a while, but they, they basically, um, break down and so by the time the spring rolls around that that's when we really have most of the nitrogen loss happening those inhibitors are no longer providing any benefit so with that i will stop but uh, i would like to also uh, acknowledge the the field crew at the uh, soil water and climate department uh, they are the the people that have done a lot of the work to be able to establish all these uh, very large trials across the state and also the research and outreach uh, center personnel that has helped us uh, locally with these things. And then the funding, which came from AFRIC, the Agriculture Fertilizer Research and Education Council. So thank you for your attention. And Karen, if there's time for questions, I can try to answer any. Yep, we're doing great on time. We got approximately eight minutes. Um, we do have, looks like four questions that popped up in the Q&A box. Um, so first, do you have access to a wide drip machine for late 28% uh, side dress application beyond VT? This practice has shown merit in many seed company trials. Um, it also says this practice takes out some of the risk of having all of the nitrogen on prior to VT, more spoon feeding, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't have one myself in my group, but uh, we do have uh, some of those available for research. And um, I actually submitted a proposal a couple of years ago. It never got funded, unfortunately, because I wanted to, to study that in more detail um, because I have seen some of that same data from seed companies. Uh, my, my thought based on uh, some other research that I have done, which is with the split application. So not so much the white drop that puts nitrogen right at the base of the crop, uh, but with split applications, I see very mixed results. The, the only place where I see a consistent benefit of uh, split applying nitrogen is in sandy soils. In fine texture soils, uh, for the most part, I see little or no benefit to split applying nitrogen. Um, again, comparing a pre-plant application to a split application, not comparing, you know, fall urea to a spring or to a split application. Um, and I think the reason for, for some of the reasons for that are that uh, if, if we apply nitrogen in the spring pre-plant, you know, soon before planting, not like five, six weeks before planting, just kind of at the time of planting, um, the potential for nitrogen loss is, is, is there, but it's more limited. I mean, in sandy soils, it's definitely a problem, and that's why we see the split application much, much more beneficial. In other locations uh, with fine texture soils, only in really, really wet years I have seen, and not consistently, that benefit of a split application. 
Um, the other question that comes up often is this thing about the placement, you know, with the white drop that you're putting nitinib right on the root. I've done a lot of research looking at root uh, architecture of corn and I suspect that there is not that much benefit. I mean, people think that just because we are putting it right at the base of the plant that that's providing a benefit. And I can tell you that uh, the roots are basically covering the entire soil volume, especially later in the season. And the placement has nothing to really do with availability at that point. Uh, and so I don't think that by putting it right at the base, you will have an improvement. That's my thought, but again, I have not done the, the research to be able to prove that with, with data, but uh, it's based on, on some of my other observations. Uh, next question is, your study shows that urea with an inhibitor does not provide a gain versus not using an inhibitor. Would this be the same in a no-till situation? Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know for sure. My suspicion is, uh, well, for file applications, as I mentioned, the inhibitor is not a bulletproof uh, technology. It will um, break down and it will not provide the protection when you really need it. For a spring situation, let's say in no-till where soils tend to be wetter, uh, that potentially could be a benefit just simply because uh, the inhibitor, if it's working, which that's the big question. I, I have, well, this study, but I have done other studies uh, with urea, with UAN, looking at instinct, where we have basically seen no benefit. To be fair, though, I, there have been a few studies, uh, but with manure, where instinct has provided some benefit. So this is injected manure. Um, but I have not seen, and I probably have, I don't know, 20 or so side years of data with instinct versus no instinct uh, comparisons, and I have seen no benefit with it. So um, there was a researcher at uh, Indiana that uh, did some looking at this inhibitor. The, the problem, I guess, is that the inhibitor is the same uh, formulation as or um, active ingredient as NSERF is nitropyrin, which we know works as a nitrification inhibitor. But I think the problem is that this uh, active ingredient in instinct is microencapsulated. And it seems from the research done at, uh, in Indiana that uh, it takes too long for the active ingredient to come out of the uh, encapsulation to be effective. In other words, you apply it with urea, let's say, um, urea transforms to nitrate, and then at that point, the inhibitor starts to come out of that encapsulation. Well, at that point, it's already nitrate, the, the nitrogen is nitrate, so there is no benefit to, to um, minimize the nitrification because the, the product is already in nitrate form. <clears throat> A um, couple more questions here about anhydrous ammonia. Is an N inhibitor helpful? And also, have you done any studies with variable rate in hydras? Yeah, so I, I don't remember if I mentioned this or not, but the fall applications with anhydrous ammonia were done with an inhibitor. Um, in this study, we didn't have a way to compare because we didn't have with and without the inhibitor, but I have done other research looking at the inhibitor. And for fall applications using NSERV, does provide a benefit. Uh, again, it's not perfect, not every year, but if you do kind of the analysis that I did in this presentation where you kind of look at how many times out of whatever number of comparisons you can do, like you know what percentage uh, uh, you may see, it is a larger percentage. So you typically will have a, a benefit more often than not with the inhibitor in the fall. For the spring applications, it is not as, um, uh, great of a benefit, but again, if it's a extremely wet spring, that's where you see an advantage. As far as variable rate with anhydrous ammonia, I have not done research, but uh, on that particular product. But uh, my thought is just like with anything else, if variable rate works uh, in your situation, then you will see that benefit uh, translated, whether you're using anhydrous ammonia or some other nitrogen source. And we've, we've got just time for one more question here. There is another one that I'll email you separately, Fabian, but this one is, is there any advantage to applying N 
or half of N as a spring urea and half as an ESN? Great, great question. Um, I am um, actually, I just put a proposal to, to AFRIC actually to, um, to see if we can uh, look at these things uh, in, in more detail. Actually, it was in AFRIC, sorry. But uh, anyway, I put a proposal to look at those questions in more detail. I think there is some certain benefit to ESN, especially under wet conditions or sandy soils. Again, the, the situations where you have a lot of potential for nitrogen loss. Um, I think there, there could be uh, an important benefit to kind of doing a split application where you apply some of the nitrogen pre-plant early on as a polymer coated so it's protected and then the side dress is more done with you know a cheaper source like urea. But, but again, uh, a lot of this is based on very limited amount of information that I have from different research that I've been doing over the years. I really want you to look at that question in more detail. So hopefully that project gets funded and, and we can look at it. All right, thank you for your time this morning. Really appreciate your, your knowledge and sharing some more information with us about nutrient management and nitrogen sources and inhibitors and the whole, whole nine yards that go with that. Um, at this time, we're gonna shift gears here a little bit. I would like to, um, so if you wanna, um, Stop sharing your screen, Fabian. I would like to introduce our next Gold Star sponsor in uh, Kurt Burns, CB Agronomics, and he is going to introduce our final panel of the day. So, Kurt, Thank you you're very up and running. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karen. Um, CB Agronomics, we have been in business for 29 years as an independent certified crop advisors in Renville, Sibley, McLeod, Meeker, Nicollet County areas. Uh, Pete Cromer and myself specialize in precision agriculture, grid soil sampling, scouting corn, soybeans, sugar beets, dry beans, alfalfa, small grains, and consultation and making independent agronomic recommendations for area producers. We also both farm in Sibley County. So I would like to introduce our three panelists today. Joe Eichley is a native of Maryland. He received a BS in Agricultural Science and Technology and his MS in Crop Protection with a focus on weed science from the University of Maryland. Joe received his PhD in weed science at Purdue University. During his time at Purdue, he also worked as a research associate and extension specialist while working on his degree. Joe started as an assist assistant professor and extension weed specialist for North Dakota State University at the end of 2018. He has a statewide extension responsibility for all crops except potato and sugar beet. His research program focuses on managing difficult to control and herbicide resistant weeds in corn, soybean, and dry edible beans. David Nikolai currently serves as regional extension educator. Crops for the University of Minnesota Extension Service at Farmington, Minnesota, and coordinator for the Institute of Ag Professionals Programming in St. Paul. In his role as the coordinator for the Institute of Ag Professional Training, Dave is originally from Renville County. Jared Goplin is an extension educator in crops with the University of Minnesota Extension. Jared received both his master's degree and PhD in agronomy from the University of Minnesota with a focus in weed science. Jared has a farming background growing up and continuing to be involved in his family's crop and livestock farm in Southwestern Minnesota. He has expertise in forages, small grains and weed science. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Kurt, for the wonderful introduction. Great, thank you very much. I think I'll start off a little bit in, in terms of moderating uh, this panel with a little explanation. Traditionally, at this point in time, we've had an opportunity uh, for uh, audience participation and questions, and we hope to work that in. Uh, I do want to preface this a little bit uh, with our guest, uh, Dr. Joe Eichley from North Dakota State University. He's kind of subbing in here a little bit. Uh, some of you are familiar with the fact that uh, Dr. Jeff Gonzalez, who has been our weed scientist extension specialist for many years, uh, retired last year. Uh, we have recruited a new weed scientist who has just come on board, uh, Dr. Devlin uh, Sangaria. And uh, Devlin um, has a family situation in terms of expecting a child here this week at this point in time. So we called an audible. And I called up Joe and I said, hey, Joe, would you come on down and uh, share some expertise? And so he was glad to do that. 
So at this point in time, I think we're going to uh, switch it over to, to uh, Jared. And uh, hopefully, Jared, you can share the document. We want to talk a little bit about in terms of herbicide and traits uh, in terms of what people can look forward to in 2021. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And you guys can see the my screen now, correct? Yes. Okay, great. So kind of the topic today, obviously, is herbicide resistant traits. There's a ton of different traits that are available, uh, more coming down the pipeline. And uh, that was kind of the inspiration behind this document that we put together last winter. Uh, this doc document was current as of January of 2020. Uh, there's a few sort of minor updates that, that could be added to this, but but really the point of this document was to really get a kind of a one or two page document uh, as a quick reference guide for when you're making your seed seed trait decisions. So uh, just as an example, my dad called me yesterday or the day before he was in making some of his, his, his uh, seed decisions in terms of ordering seed. And he called me wondering what in the heck all the different tolerances these different varieties have. And his question was specifically the Liberty Link GT27 soybeans. So, that's really the point of this document is to answer some of those questions and, and give a quick reference guide. So uh, any of you guys who are maybe seed dealers or, or help select seed, you know, it's something to maybe have on your desk or send to, send to your farmers if they're wondering what they can apply on which crops. So it's pretty straightforward. We did use or include all the crops that are, are relatively common and have traits in Minnesota and North Dakota. So of course we start out with alfalfa. That one's pretty simple with Roundup Ready alfalfa. Uh, canola, probably not a lot of canola down in, the, in, in this neck of the woods. Uh, and then finally, the second page has corn and soybean. Um, so corn, of course, we uh, just to orient you to these tables, it's kind of down that, that vertical uh, table list. If you can see my cursor here, you know, we basically go from conventional, you know, glyphosate tolerant, Liberty Link, and, and so on and so forth. And then across the top of these tables, we have the different uh, herbicide products or active ingredients. So glyphosate, uh, glufosinate, 2,4-D choline, and and the FOP ACC ACE inhibitor. So same story with the soybean list, which of course is our, our most complicated. Uh, there are in fact other herbicide traits out there in soybeans that are, are pretty uncommon. Uh, however, there are some others out there that aren't even on this list. So it is almost more complicated than it is presented, but uh, really these are the varieties that are available in our, our growing region and uh, really help you uh, to, to, to know at least as a kind of a quick reference or, or for farmers to know which, which tolerances are in each of these soybeans. So for instance, with my dad's question, the Liberty Link GT27, if you highlight that, it's got glyphosate tolerance, glufosinate or Liberty and the HPPD inhibitors. And if you see that sort of uh, footnote there, you go down here to the bottom, uh, basically it says that they're resistance uh, to the isoxaflutol pre-emergence and then, and then does make some statements on, on regulatory issues as well with some of these different traits. So, uh, and then finally, there is some sugar beets and wheat at the bottom, but again, those are, are pretty straightforward uh, at this time. Uh, there is, I guess, some um, plans to, as, as different traits become available with soybeans or sugar beets, um, to add these additional traits as they become, become available. So kind of a quick orientation, Karen did put the link to, uh, I believe that was the link to this, this PDF on the North Dakota State University Extension site. Uh, it is on our U of M site as well, but we can't uh, put PDFs there. So quite frankly, it doesn't look as nice. So uh, I, do, uh, I do prefer this format anyway. So with that, I'll uh, quit sharing my screen. And uh, unless Dave, you want me to go in, into any more detail? Um, I don't think we need to right now. We can certainly come back to it, Jared, as we get uh, questions. But I think we're going to segue over to uh, Joe. And one of the things that was listed on uh, the fact sheet was Enlist. And uh, I think you're going to be talking a little bit about some of the work that you've done with that and some other products as well. Uh, and I'll uh, turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, everyone, for the, uh, the invite down here today. It's a little bit easier to come down to Minnesota when I don't have to leave my uh, kitchen here. Uh, so what I was going to do was just discuss some of the you know, some of the trials and tribulations of what we've learned in the first two years of using Enlist up here. Um, if you look at the Red River Valley in 2019, we were the top region in the U.S. for a percent adoption of Enlist in soybean, and we increased those acres in 2020 as well. So we've, we've learned a thing or two, and I'm going to kind of go through this relatively quickly uh, so we can also discuss the Dicamba and ExtendFlex after, afterwards as well since that will be new to many in 2021. 
I'm going to break this down into kind of three sections, and I'll just say we'll call it the good, the bad, and the ugly of Enlist. And so first, I haven't had the chance to compile data yet, but I wanted to show some pictures of some of the results from this year about, you know, what can we do post-emergence with the Enlist soybean? And so um, when, I, when I say Enlist, I'm talking about the E3 soybean, as uh, Jared just showed, and that means we have tolerance to glyphosate or Roundup, glufosinate, which is the Liberty type products, and then the 2,4-D choline products, in this case, Enlist 1. And so, you know, three different modes of action that we can apply post-emergence. Uh, all the pictures I'll be showing uh, have water hemp in them. That's one of our major weeds up here in, in, in my part of the world. Uh, this, this system will also work very well on giant and common ragweed. And since Jared's kind of the giant ragweed expert, I'll let him uh, insert his comments a little bit later. So first of all, you know, what are the, some of the things we can do post-emergence? I, I want to share with, with these pictures, these are all from 2020. Uh, we did apply pre-emergence herbicides to most of our plots, but then it didn't rain for 19 days after we applied those pre's. So we had a situation up here that, you know, does occur from time to time, failure of our pre-emergence herbicides. And then June was very hot and dry. So one thing I'll just point out is we did not get good control with one post-emergence application. The best programs we had together this year were two uh, sequential post-emergence applications. So this picture here on the left, you know, with this system, we can still do Roundup followed by Roundup. If you have a glyphosate resistant uh, water hemp profile like we do, that's of course what your results will be. On the right, this is um, a tank mix of Liberty plus Enlist One at a quart and a quart. And we also did have uh, some AMS uh, in, in this tank mix. This was applied to three inch tall water hemp as you can see, we did do a pretty good job cleaning up the water hemp, but there's still several escapes in there. So for, for a one application, you know, this is a, a pretty good tank mix this year with, with the pre's not working and with a pretty robust water hemp population, of course, did not get the job done, but uh, certainly better than, than some alternatives. And just to highlight that again, so here is uh, the picture again on the right is Liberty Plus and List One, a quart and a quart. The picture here on the left is a court of liberty plus AMS. So, you know, this tank mix together is certainly going to look better than applying liberty alone. And that's, you know, that's what weed scientists all over the country have seen is when we're going after our broadleaf weeds, liberty plus enlist one is a pretty good tank mix combination. Uh, some site years we can certainly get complete control, but again, we had very challenging weather conditions um, with especially those hot and dry conditions in June. And again, just showing we can do some different sequential applications since we do have the tolerance to all three. And, and this is what we're showing here when we followed up that Liberty application 14 days later with another application of Liberty is what we're looking at on the right side of the screen here. And looks pretty clean. If we were to pull the canopy aside, there was still some water hemp that, that escaped this type of program. But again, you know, if we, if we plan our follow-up application two weeks later, we can do a pretty good job of cleaning up those escapes. I point that out because this has looked really, really good in our plots. A planned uh, sequential application two weeks after the first one. But commercially, I, I have received several complaints about Liberty followed by Liberty. Once we kind of walk through the details and, and figure out what happened, it's usually Liberty was sprayed, a failure was noticed, and then Liberty was reapplied about four weeks later. And that's a little bit more challenging to clean up plants after they've had more time to regrow. Uh, but when we plant it as a two week later application, especially knowing our pre's didn't work, we had challenging conditions, did a pretty good job cleaning it up. And so of course this works in, in list. This would also work in the extend flex soybean system uh, this upcoming year, which also has Liberty tolerance. Or if you can still find the LLGT27 or straight Liberty link, this program on the right would work in any of those platforms. What we can get into a little bit more with Enlist. So on the left here is just uh, a Liberty Plus Enlist tank mix followed 14 days later, later by the same tank mix. And on the right, we kind of combined all three together, followed it up again, all three together as well. And these ones both were pretty good. If we pull the canopy aside, we might find the stray plant, but otherwise a uh, very good control having tank mix and sequentials. Uh, one thing that I will point out here again, the only adjuvant we used was AMS at three pounds per acre. 
within each tank mix listed here on the screen. Another thing I'll kind of point out <clears throat> is that we can do this in the enlist system. Uh, in the GT27 or the Extend Flex, we can do Liberty plus Roundup. One thing we'll get into a little bit later when we have more panel discussion, uh, at least in 2021, the labels will prohibit, prohibit the mixing of Liberty plus Dicamba in the Extend systems. So if we were to try and put this in the Extend Flex system, uh, for instance, Liberty Roundup plus a Dicamba product, that would be prohibited on, on labels going in, into 2021. So one, one subtle difference there between the Extend Flex and the uh, E3 system. So that's kind of the good part of, of the program here, showing that we do have some pretty good options to clean up a, a tough weed like water hemp, even in a challenging year like we faced up here in 2020. To get into some of the bad, here's just kind of an overview thing. I, I really want to focus on the middle part here. Um, you know, what we've found with two years up here is that Enlist One is the preferred product over Enlist Duo. Enlist Duo is the tank mix of uh, glyphosate plus the 2,4-D choline. A couple of reasons that if we use Enlist One, we can use whatever glyphosate product we want at whatever glyphosate rate we want. And then currently we cannot tank mix Liberty with Enlist Duo. So just more flexibility in the Enlist One product. <clears throat> But if we jump to the bottom here, we can have some mixing compatibility issues with Enlist One and some other products. And so that's what I want to show here as kind of the bad of, you know, there's, there's some compatibility issues, but we can overcome them if we, uh, if we have some patience and mind our P's and Q's. So what I did here is pulled from the Enlist website, just like the Dicamba products, to use Enlist One, you have to go to the website to see what products we can tank mix with Enlist One. This uh, has probably been updated, but here's the glyphosate products a couple months ago that were approved. If I pull it out, I'm gonna pick on three, Durango, Credit 41 Extra, and Roundup Power Max. I'm pointing out those three because they are three different formulated salts of glyphosate. So we have you know, our typical, we have DMA salts, IPA salts, and then potassium salts. So why is this important when I'm talking about Enlist? Well, they are different salts, and this does come into play with the Enlist choline, with the 2,4-D choline. The 2,4-D choline was formulated to be a tank mixed with a, a DMA-type salt, and something that we can certainly figure out, or and we definitely figured out commercially in 2019, was that there is com some compatibility issues with potassium salts of glyphosate and the 2,4-D choline product. Where we really see these issues take place is when the two uh, concentrated products, so for instance, Roundup Power Max and Enlist One come into direct contact with each other in low water volume situations. So the picture here, we, we mix products in about one gallon per acre equivalent. Uh, DMA on the left, IPA in the middle, K salt on the right. Just focusing on that potassium salt, not a lot of water, high concentration products added at the same time. And we can see they're actually starting to salt out of that solution. The other area this takes place a lot commercially is in inductor cones or induction cones when these products come into contact with each other and, and are not rinsed out between adding products. So what this looks like an hour later, if we shook these bottles up, uh, the DMA and the IPA salts stayed in solution where we had that crystallization occur and the potassium salt, it never went back into solution and we could never find a way to get it back into solution. So if we rushed our mixing procedure, had this occur, it was kind of a, uh, we were not able to, to resolve that issue inside the tank. We also see this with AMS. If we add the Enlist One, uh, the 2,4-D choline into a tank with just water and AMS, and that AMS has not been fully dissolved, same issue. So again, if, if we do take the time to let the AMS dissolve, we do not have this, this compatibility issue. Just a few more pictures of the crystals that we made. And so this was a, a pretty big deal up here in 2019. And, and the winter season last year focused on the, the correct mixing procedures. So Corteva put this little handy chart together and they did bold out step seven when adding glyphosates. If you use that potassium salt, you basically have to take your time, add one product at a time. And that is our way to be able to use a potassium salt like Roundup Power Max without having that issue. It takes time and it takes water. So just something to keep in mind 
uh, that we can't overcome this. And just a picture, we, we've had a couple issues with Liberty, not to the same scale, but here on the right, you can see we did have a little bit of salting out occur, but not nearly at the, the level that we did see with the potassium salts of glyphosate. And what I wanna show here is when we follow the, the direct procedure, and this is on the left, the equivalent of five gallons per acre in a tank of carrier volume, and then 10, when we added water, about uh, 50 to 70% of the, of the final water, then AMS, let that dissolve for two to three minutes, then our potassium salt of glyphosate, give it another two minutes, and then the choline, everything went into, into the tank just fine, mixed, and we did not have that compatibility issue. On the right just shows four days, we let these bottles sit here four days later, still no salting out. So this is an issue that occurs at the time of mixing. And again, we overcome it by just having some patience, one product at a time, and then we're able to use our, our potassium salt of glyphosate of choice and, and not have these issues. And then one thing I'll point out, this is kind of the, uh, the ugly part of the, of the presentation here, is that we can certainly have some antagonism with our group one herbicides, such as Select and uh, 2,4-D uh, and List one in this system. This also applies to a mixing of dicamba and a group one herbicide in, in the Extend or the Extend Flex system. We do see a little bit more antagonism from 2,4-D on our group one herbicides than we will from dicamba. And I just wanna show this chart here in a couple pictures. So we, we went ahead and looked at some different tank mixes, what we called a low, a medium, and a high rate of a group one herbicide. So the left here is a Sure2, Fusilade, and then Select. The different colored bars from left to right are the product alone. So a Sure2 alone at that low rate, tank mixed with uh, a quart of Enlist One, the mid rate tank mixed with a quart of Enlist One, and then the high rate tank mix with that quart and list one. So from the data, what we see here are just by using that same rate, but adding in list one, we lost over 60% control of uh, volunteer round of pretty corn. And it really took using a, a, a higher rate, about twice the amount of a share two with that tank mix to get close, uh, back up close to the control level we saw without and list one in that tank. The same trend we saw for Fusilade and Select, uh, but not nearly as severe as a Sure2 as far as that antagonism. But we do see antagonism uh, from 2,4-D on our group one herbicides. Uh, we definitely see that in volunteer corn and we can see it in some of our more challenging grasses such as barnyard grass. So just a couple of pictures of what this looks like. The top here is a Sure2 applied by itself the low rate. And then this bottom left picture, tank mixed with Enlist 1 at that low rate. Bottom middle is tank mixed with Enlist 1, uh, the graminicide at the medium rate. And the bottom right is that higher rate we used. So in this case, um, Enlist 1 plus about four ounces of Assure 2 looks like it might be a good candidate to apply in our corn uh, to control our weeds because the corn was overall hardly touched. And it took that high rate to, to again get some good control of our volunteer corn. Fusilade, same kind of pattern that we needed the high rate to get anywhere close to what we were seeing without having Enlist 1 thrown into that tank. And then again with Select, um, kind of the same pattern, but just not as severe of, of antagonism as we saw with the Sure 2. So kind of reviewing the last two parts of, of what I just talked about, we can see these compatibility issues when we mix Enlist 1 with either uh, with a potassium salt of glyphosate like Roundup Power Max or with AMS. You know, the way we overcome this is either use a different formulation of glyphosate that's a different salt, or we take time uh, and, and really pay attention to our mixing procedure, let everything mix into solution before adding the next product. But as far as the grass antagonism, like I said, it, it tends to be more problematic with the Sure2. Uh, but we can certainly see it with something like uh, Selector Clethodim, which is what we use by far on more of our acres for, uh, for random for, or volunteer corn control. So the, the best way to overcome that is if you don't want to split the applications out and have two different applications, is that you just need to raise the rate of your graminicide that you throw into the tank when you have 2,4-D choline in there, at least by an additional third over the rate that you're planning on, unless you want to see a loss of control. 
So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and then we'll turn it back over to Dave. And I think we'll talk about Extend Flex and a few other things. I think before we do that, um, Karen, do you want to mention anything about if folks need uh, would like to ask questions where they should place them? Sure. Um, you know, continue to use the Q and A box if you've got any questions that pop up kind of throughout. We'll try to get those uh, questions to our panelists here as quick as we can. Uh, it is a panel, so if you've got specific questions on products, let us know so that we can address them during today's program. We had one question earlier, Jared, um, in terms of the timing of the, of the fact sheet, there was a comment that Isoxaflutol actually has had some clearance in some counties uh, in the state and so forth. I don't know if you want to mention that briefly, but, but things obviously changed since that was produced. Uh, but in, in terms of that uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks for pointing that out. And, you know, like Dave mentioned, January 2020 is when that document was current. Obviously, it seems like every week something changes with regulatory approval. Uh, and isoxaflutol is approved in, what is it, maybe eight or 10 counties or something in Minnesota. I think a lot of those are kind of in that central area. I'm not real familiar with the area. And uh, Joe, I think there's a couple counties in North Dakota as well, but certainly not a widespread approval. Is that correct? Uh, actually, up here, no. The BASF is made the decision to just go ahead and forego getting that approved in our state. But uh, the product name is, it's Elite 27, right? A-L-I-T-E 27. Okay. So I guess, I guess all said and done, just make sure you check the labels. You know, with some of these products, obviously they have some uh, very nuanced requirements. So it, it takes a, a full-time uh, position to keep on top of all these things, it seems like. So, so make sure you do, do reference those and, and talk to uh, some of the, the ag chem suppliers as well. They should be on top of those, those changes. And your, uh, your seed supplier as, as well for that particular area. Uh, as we go forward, I just want to segue a little bit, Joe um, and, and Jared, let's talk a little bit about biology in this last year. Uh, we noticed, I think, in a lot of locations, and I think you folks did too, that we had a very early emergence of water hemp. Now, some people say, well, that was just the time of the year, is, or is our climate shifting, you know, uh, et cetera, or, or biology, but any observations about that or strategies given the traits and the products that we do have in hand going forward. So Joe, I'll throw it over to you first. Yeah, yeah, so certainly as you, as you mentioned, uh, we we found water hemp emergence up here uh, as early as May 1st. And I think our earliest prior observation was sometime that third week of May. And so it, it's probably somewhat related to the, our wet fall, our saturated soils and a couple of of days in the upper 70s and that sun beating on our black dirt, but it did create a challenge. Um, for, for many, it occurred early enough that we still had to conventionally till in the spring to clean up uh, just to prepare the seed beds. So that kind of helped us in some ways. Uh, one thing that we did see up here um, with the dicamba systems is that when we added in some dicamba with our pre-emergence herbicide, it did help clean up some of those small water hemp that weren't controlled by tillage or or were certainly merged early. Um, otherwise, you know, if we, we would have had to have a pretty aggressive burn down or aggressive tillage to control what was what had emerged, but we hadn't touched our field yet because of how wet we were this spring. So it was still manageable in both systems, but if you went no-till, this is one of the year that we saw a, a benefit of adding dicamba pre-emergence in the extend systems to clean up those early flushes of water hemp. I guess uh, one of the questions that just came in, and I think we'll talk about this, and Jared, maybe you can answer this. Are pre-emerged herbicides still on your recommended practices? And would you like to talk about that and maybe about layering uh, as well in, in those concepts? Yeah, so short answer is yes. Uh, you know, we cannot, we can absolutely cannot uh, remove the pre's out of the mix, no matter how much you want to save money or whatever it might be. Um, but really, just to get back kind of to the, the main point, I guess I always have when we talk about these herbicide traits is, is know what weeds you're dealing with. You know, that's kind of what back relates to the, the emergence patterns. Um, so if you guys, you know, want to enter into the chat, you know, you're more than welcome, you know, the weeds that you're dealing with or, you know, any other types of issues that have popped up. Um, I don't know if you can see, I don't know if everybody can see that, but, but we, we can, as the three panelists, we can see those comments. So we're more than happy to discuss any of those uh, weird weed issues if you've seen water hemp emerging earlier or whatever. Um, 
but really the point is knowing what weeds you have, you know, you guys, a lot of you guys are kind of in that uh, crossover area where you have probably a lot of giant ragweed issues uh, as well as some water hemp. And I've always, when I was in grad school, I, I did all my work on giant ragweed and, and I kind of joked around down in, in the Rochester area, kind of my worst nightmare is to have both because giant ragweed emerges very early in the growing season, basically 90% of ragweed giant ragweeds out of the ground by June 1. And that's just when water hemp is starting to, to get going. So to, man, to, to put together a herbicide program to target both of those weeds gets to be very challenging because we basically have weeds emerging from middle of April all the way through the end of July. Now, that being said, with some of these traits, there, there are some, some ways we can use them that really target those weeds. So if you have both ragweed and, and water hemp, Ragweed really doesn't like growth regulators. Typically the 2,4-D or dicamba products work very well on common or giant ragweed. So I really like the idea of using those early. And then in terms of dicamba or, or 2,4-D even for that matter, you know, they've never been great water hemp herbicides. So that's where we need to think about other strategies. Um, so some of these programs might have Liberty um, or, other, or the other products kind of at your disposal, but don't forget about the biology. You know, even in the best case scenario, if we get those post applications on by the end of June, which is kind of the ideal, we really don't want to be making these applications into July because the growth rates of these weeds are just tremendous. So we need to keep those weeds at bay, you know, even into July, which is after the sprayers, you know, quit, quit running as well. So that's where we need to think about the layered approach, really keeping those water hemp in the ground. So not only use a pre early on, um, but also then putting in those, those, uh, those herbicides as a layered approach, you know, your dual, your warrant, um, you know, those types of products, outlook, um, really to suppress that water hemp as it continues to emerge, you know, through, through July. So that's really the, the target there. And, and also thinking about crop canopy, you know, making sure we're doing what we can to get that crop canopy developed because we're still gonna have water hemp emerging in August, um, especially in some years. And there's really nothing you can do then other than, you know, piss off the soybeans by putting Cobra over the top. So um, that's where the canopy also is very important. But, but really knowing what traits and what weeds you have out there and which traits, you know, work the best on these weeds. So um, we maybe should uh, put in a, uh, a link to the NDSU weed control guide. Joe, I don't know if that's uh, the new one's available yet, or it probably will be soon if it's not. Should be online by the January 1st and then in print following shortly thereafter. So if you guys aren't familiar, nice, nice reference guide to see which herbicides work best on different weeds. So with that, I guess I'll, that's my answer. That's my long answer to your easy question, Dave. <laughs> Can you give a short, short one sentence answer when we talk about layered? And so the folks understand that, you know, we have to go look at the labels on the pre's, but just briefly describe what we're talking about there. So really this layered approach, and I'm going to guess a lot of you have either used it or have thought about using this approach. Um, you know, we farm in Western Yellow Medicine County, and it's been something most people have been doing the last few years because water hemp is, is just, you know, a big pain in, in the butt. So basically it's using your pre and then coming back with one of those post applications, you know, kind of that mid-June uh, application timing and adding in that dual, the warrant. Um, I think Zidua now has a little bit later, um, later label now to be used uh, for those layered type of applications. If you guys grow sugar beets, um, you know, it's probably a strategy you've used as well. Uh, most of these do rely on the group 15 herbicides primarily, which, um, you know, we have seen some resistance pop up in other parts of the country. So there is some concern there, but, but really it's this concept of keeping a residual product out there to keep water hemp in the ground. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, and we have a couple slides and, and Joe and Jared, you uh, certainly uh, go ahead and and have an opportunity here to uh, uh, make some comments as, as we go forward. And um, let's see here if I can get it. I might have to go back in here. But the opportunity here is that, that we do have, uh, you know, basically uh, those things that have to do with um, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to cover um, the uh, changes and so forth. And we're not going to have time, obviously, uh, from uh, for for all of this, uh, but we will uh, hopefully have have an opportunity to talk about some of these. And as I mentioned before, Deblin, uh, our new weed scientist, actually put some of these slides together here for another uh, program and, and is allowing us to take a, a look at it. And, and of course, those of you who are familiar area, these are some pictures I took and other people did. You know, in the years gone past in Renville County, and certainly these are concerns 
about water hemp and control and so forth. Uh, given the fact of where we're at, a number of us had an opportunity to attend a North Central Weed Science meetings here. Just a little bit of a time frame uh, going forward here with the different products. And you, know, you notice the, uh, the years are indicated here, glufosinate, uh, glyphosate, uh, dicamba, and so forth in, in, uh, in the extend soybeans. And, the, and then as Jared mentioned earlier, the GT27 uh, with the zoxoflutol, the Enlist. And then following, of course, obviously the extend flex which uh, has a trait for glyphosinate, glufosinate, or the Liberty and, uh, and, and the dicamba. Uh, but I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit briefly here about uh, the dicamba labeling and uh, Joe and Jared jump in here. These are just uh, a summary of some of the things that we need to be taking a look at uh, going forward. Uh, there will be training again, uh, basically all online here, but things to keep in mind in, in terms of this labeling uh, as it goes forward here, uh, we've, we've got certainly besides the mandatory record keeping, uh, the application wind speed and, uh, and the spray volume, uh, the, the temperature inversion still is, is right there an hour after sunrise and two hours before sunset. Uh, you check for that presence of the endangered species, uh, use of AMS uh, and triple rinse uh, in, in terms of over the top. Um, any comments, Jared or um, Joe on this particular slide? No, I think the next one's the more important one. All right. All right. We'll take a look in here. Um, this is a little bit on, on Extendamax and, and Tavium. Re, they both require the use of a qualified uh, situation here of a, of a buffering agent and, an, and a drift reducing agent. Um, uh, the Ingenia requires the use of a qualified pH buffering agent. So these are some of the changes in terms of the requirements uh, going forward on the new uh, label as it's as it's indicated, and I know Joe, if you've worked with any of these yet, I uh, I have not worked with them yet. Well, I've worked a little bit with one last year from an efficacy standpoint, but the other issue is we're still waiting for a list of of approved products. The both websites are currently down as far as what the approved products are. So that's they're, going to be more clear as we move through the winter. There, and that's something to pay attention to. Uh, the bottom line is uh, the buffering agents to reduce the, you know, the uh, propensity, obviously, of volatility here, um, in addition to when you add other products uh, with that and situation going forward. So um, that will be a, obviously, uh, obviously a mandatory requirement uh, that people look at besides the drift reducing agent. Uh, there are some downwind buffer changes here, 240 feet to sensitive areas, um, you know, except there's 110 feet with a qualified hood sprayer and 310 feet with uh, if there's endangered species on there. Uh, now, in terms of Minnesota, uh, it's gonna be different than in North Dakota, Joe, and in, in different situations. Right now, the federal label does have a cutoff of June 30th. Uh, we're expecting full, we haven't had full registration yet in the state of Minnesota, uh, just like it is perhaps in, in other states in Indiana and uh, Illinois. So uh, once that is a, a, a approached, uh, we may see this changing in Minnesota. We don't know, uh, the Minnesota Department of Ag is currently considering those. And uh, the word on the street is that we might hear a little bit more here by the end of the month before the first of the year. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, the extended max should not be applied after our R1 uh, in soybeans. And there's, but there's uh, no application of, of Tavium after V4. Any comments from you guys? I think that's pretty well uh, sent forward there. Um, single application doses of extended max at the 22 ounce uh, rate and Ingenia 12.8, uh, maximum of uh, four applications and don't apply it if uh, the soil is saturated or rainfall is forecast within uh, uh, 48 hours. Obviously you have to check out the latest, you know, herbicide labels as we, uh, as we go forward uh, uh, with that. Karen, how are we doing on time? We are, we're getting right there. You guys got about two minutes left before I have a couple announcements to make. Um, oh. Okay, I'll stop and see if there are, um, at, at this point, uh, any questions uh, that are in there in the chat box or comments. Um, I, I maybe just have one about the uh, FLEX program. And I know Jared and, and Joe, when you think about this, you have opportunities with uh, different traits out there for with the Liberty trade as well. Any, any sense on if you're gonna use this program in terms of timing of say, for example, uh, a one product going on earlier and glufosinate going on later. Um, any comments on what you like, Joe? 
Yeah, so in the extend flex, you know, we'd really want to see that dicamba go on first just because there's less sensitive vegetation out at that time and reduces the chance of off-target movement. Uh, labeling in list one, you're actually allowed to apply later than you can apply Liberty. And uh, in, our, in our efficacy work, we've actually seen that work better, Liberty first than in list one second. Colleagues further south of me have seen the opposite though. So you know, down in southern Minnesota, it might be best to have the growth regulator first and then Liberty second. But I think from a stewardship and off-target movement perspective, that growth regulator first followed by Liberty is probably one of the best ways to go. I would agree. And the only thing I'd add is <laughs> by later, we don't mean in July as a rescue <laughs> treatment. Um, you know, Liberty is a contact herbicide. So coverage is, is essential. If you don't get good coverage, especially on water hemp, you wait a week or two and it'll be growing back just as fast. So uh, make sure we are paying attention to those label requirements too. You know, Liberty is, it's either R1 or R2. So it's certainly not a very late um, application um, restriction there, but um, earlier is always better. You know, nothing good happens in July. You know, that's, I know that's something Jeff used to say and, and it's really the truth because once you get into July, those weeds just grow like crazy. I, I'll just uh, sum this up in terms of the other things that we probably didn't talk about. Uh, basically, we don't really have new any herbicide mode of action uh, in, in 2021. We have a number of products that are being mixed together in pre-mixes. So it's always good if you're looking, looking with your supplier or your crop advisor to find out a little bit more about what's in that. If it's a name that you don't know, uh, drill down to find out what's in that pre-mix uh, to help you from a rotation standpoint, make sure that you're not going to injure the crop on it. Uh, Karen, I think I'm going to stop. I know we're right up against the time here. Uh, certainly people can email us uh, later on or email you and you can forward on if they have uh, more weed control uh, questions uh, in this area. Yeah, absolutely. And we appreciate all three of you, uh, Joe and Jared, as well as Dave for providing us some additional information on the herbicide side of things. You know, I actually had a comment from one of the attendees. It's nice to be able to see and hear exactly what's going on on the take mix side of things, what they should be doing, slowing down to make sure that they're doing it right, to make sure that that product's getting to where they intended uh, to get to. So do appreciate your time. Um, well, I'll make sure that I share both of those resources with attendees in the follow-up email. Uh, for those that are still on, um, you know, just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items here to kind of wrap up today's program. This event has been recorded uh, in an, a couple of days. I'm hoping to get it out so that you can rewatch if there's different parts of the presentations you might have to step away from. Um, or uh, have a friend that you're like, hey, you need to watch this part of this presentation. So um, we'll get those out. I did throw an evaluation in the chat as well. We really appreciate your thoughts and comments about um, today's program, as well as shifting to this online version, if you liked it or not. I really just wanna hear uh, your take on everything uh, that we had today. Plus, if you do decide to uh, complete that survey and give us your name and mailing address, you get entered for a chance to win some gift cards. So little incentive for helping us complete that evaluation. Again, thank you to all of our key sponsors, our Gold Star sponsors, as well as all of our others that really helped this program uh, continue to go and that key relationship that we have with the Hutchinson Chamber of Commerce Agribusiness Committee. This program could not happen without them. And finally, I just want to say again, thank you all for coming um, and transitioning to this new way of doing this program. And just a, a final congratulations to Kelly Reiner as the winner of the Hutchinson Chamber of Commerce Agri, um, Agribusiness Committee Ag Person of the Year Award. And with that, thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful day um, and take a couple of little nuggets with you along the way.